Dusty, have you ever gone on a hunting trip? Well, yeah. You pack all your stuff. Let's say you're driving to New Hampshire. Let's say I'm driving to Ohio, and you're hunting for four, five, six days. What's the biggest challenge you usually have? You're going to stop multiple times and get gas, and I, I worry about odor the whole way. It's always in the back of your head. After talking to our friend Tim Gothier, we realized that there's a better solution that is portable. And that solution is called the ScentLock Enforcer. This nifty little device about the size of an iPhone, it produces ozone. Ozone is this naturally occurring O3 molecule that actually naturally removes odors, kills bacteria, binds to all kinds of odor particles in the air, and basically makes you scent-free instead of like a scent cover-up. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. You can put this in your toe. It operates off of a USB and has an eight-hour battery life. It's the personal ozone generator. It is the personal ozone generator. If you want to check it out, go to scentlockenforcer.com. That's S-C-E-N-T-L-O-K enforcer.com. Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast, powered by Scentlock Enforcer, episode number 175, Neil Pendleton. A 1,490-day deer story from the big woods of Maine to the urban areas of New Hampshire and the power of mock scrapes. Please support our sponsors as they make this show possible. Today's show is sponsored by the Scentlock Enforcer, the Eurohanger, and Morse's Sporting Goods. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Hi, this is John Salone with Interviews with the Masters Podcast. And when I'm not editing my own podcast, I'm listening to the Big Buck Registry with Jay Scott. This is Nick Penizzato, the CEO of the National Deer Alliance, and you're about to push play on my favorite show, the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast. This is Sam Ubel from Whitetail Adrenaline, and I'm pressing play on one of my favorite podcasts, Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. My name is Jay, and we're fresh off Thanksgiving. Hopefully everything's going well, and hopefully you're back out in the field hunting deer. One of the biggest deer I ever killed was the day after Thanksgiving. But we wanted to say thank you for pushing play and joining us once again for another hour of deer hunting entertainment, bringing you world-class deer hunters as we dissect their habits and strategies so that you can too. When I say we... I mean me and my good friend and co-host from Ohio, Dusty Phillips. How are you, Dusty? What's shaking, Jay? Shaking bacon, like like the turkey's been shook. You know, it's uh, this show's pre-recorded, but I'm going to say that this time Saturday, I'm going to be still full as a tick. <laughs> Lots of leftovers in the household this time of year. Uh, geez, I'll, I'll be full as a tick, Jay. I actually love this time of year because there's plenty of food, there's plenty of stories to tell. You, you meet with your your family and friends and then you go deer hunting you get some time off you know there's some there's always that extra day you got thanksgiving off usually there's that friday you have off and they have the weekend and there's lots of activity in the woods for the deer i mean it's the perfect time of year as far as the rut's concerned they're running around it's cold out the temperature's right it's crisp and it's quiet just a good formula and I mean, i'm not a huge fan of the rut but but it's it's some of the biggest opportunities to see a buck that you hadn't seen on your cameras all year. I couldn't agree more. And then uh, the 28th year, Ohio deer gun kicks off. So I'm, I'm excited about that. Now that is something to look forward to. So the 28th in Ohio, that's when that's that's going down. Yeah, I mean, it's something to get excited about. But mm-hmm. you can't always guarantee that the deer are going to cooperate that the, in the way you, in the form you want them to. Right. Right. They, they, you know, they don't usually cooperate in the way you want to. We, I was talking to Tom Staples over at Morris's Sporting Goods today. I went and uh, picked up a couple of the vests that I ordered. And, you know, I wanted one of those, some of the, the orange vests that have the, the breakup black in it instead of having just solid orange. Right. What did I do? I called Morris's Sporting Goods because they have the specialty stuff. And I was able to go and feel the material on some of the other vests. And then I was able to pick out the exact pattern that I wanted. You know, we had a few different to pick from. And I... 
Tom called me today. He said, you know, your order's in. So I went over and picked it up. And in doing so, I was talking to Tom about his favorite time of year to hunt. And he just got back from Kansas. And we were discussing that. And his favorite time of the year is the same as mine. I don't know, I don't know what yours is, Dusty. I've never actually asked you what your favorite time of year is to hunt. But we both concluded that it was the last week in October. And I extended it into the first week in November. I couldn't agree more to that. No kidding. I was getting ready to say Halloween week and first week in November. There you go. It's it's the, it's prime time. It, yes, that is the pristine time for me. And it seems like most hunters kind of agree with that. Cool, Jay. And hey, everybody, don't forget uh, a couple shows back we did a, a kind of a, a tree stand safety show. And, and if uh, you're in the need of a safety harness, Shoot uh, Jay, myself, or Jim an email, uh, Jay at BigBuckRegistry.com, Dusty at BigBuckRegistry.com, or Jim at BigBuckRegistry.com, and we'll see if we can't uh, get you a safety harness in the mail Yes, and uh, get you home after the hunt. The safety harness program that we have it wasn't intentional, really, but it, it just kind of, we were say we've got some spares, and if you'd like one, email us. Uh, my supply is down to one. I've sent out two. Jim had a few. He sent out two. Um, and uh, you had some, but I think you found that some were expired, and we had to throw those away. So I uh, replenished that with one of the ones that I had. And turns out, Dusty, that Neil Pendleton is ponying up. He's got six from that he's collected over the years, but a lot of us have our own harnesses. So if you need one, don't have one, never bought one, they're still using tree stands and never came with one, can't afford to buy one, let us know. Just like Dusty said, just email us, and we will get you on the list. As long as the supply lasts, we'll send it out. But if you have some, if you have some to donate to the cause, let us know as well. Turns out Neil Pendleton is our guest on the show today. Pretty cool. It's pretty darn cool. So, Neil, if you don't know Neil, let me just kind of set this up. Neil is a native of Maine, and he lives in New Hampshire now. And as this goes... Uh, we pay attention to those that send in an, an unusual large number of large bucks to our Facebook page. And this this whole method of sending pictures into the big buck registry, well, there's a method to the madness. The reason we do it is so we can track who's sending in lots of big bucks. And when we find that right person, we reach out for the interview because we know they're doing something special. We want to know how they do it so we can share it with you. And this is no exception. Neil sent in a, a really nice New Hampshire buck, and I think he tagged you in it, Dusty, because he wanted you to see it. And he said, see, there are big deer in New Hampshire. Right. Right. And Neil is 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 a really talented deer hunter. He sent in that one picture. And then I, when I was down in the Bedford, New Hampshire area, I was only not far from where he lives. And he had just shot a buck that morning. So I drove down to see it. And it was another nice buck. And it turns out today... Neil shot another buck with his bow. That was another nice buck. And now he's on his way to Maine to go deer hunt in Maine, where it looks like he's going to be doing some tracking because the snow is flying up there. The guy's intense. Crazy, ain't it? It's crazy. So we're going to get to learn how Neil does it and share all the techniques that he uses in New Hampshire to be successful. And believe me, and Dusty, you can attest to this. If you're shooting big deer routinely in New Hampshire, you're doing some, you're a very talented hunter. <laughs> That that that's no lie right there. Yes, that is no lie. I mean, I chase these things all the time, and I'm not as talented as Neil. He's got something figured out, and I want to know what that is. And you're going to figure it out too if you're listen carefully to what Neil has to say. But before we get to Neil, let's turn to Jim Keller with the Deer News. The Deer News this week is sponsored by the Eurohanger. You don't have to spend big bucks to hang your big buck. Get yourself a Eurohanger. Facebook.com forward slash Eurohanger, E-U-R-O-H-A-N-G-E-R. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. And our first story this week, Dead Deer Wakes Up in Trunk, Surprises Driver. This story was featured on the Milwaukee, Wisconsin Journal Sentinel website and was written by Meg Jones. When a 59-year-old man in Adams County hit and killed a deer last week, he did what many Wisconsinites would do. He put in his trunk to take home for the delicious venison. But before he could return home, the deer woke up. Like the Monty Python sketch, I'm not dead yet, the deer was not yet ready to go gently into the night. The motorist contacted the Adams County Sheriff's Department around 7.25 p.m. Thursday, and when the deputy arrived on the scene in Easton Township, his dashboard camera recorded the scene. The deputy talked to the motorist for about half a minute before the man gingerly opened his trunk. 
The deer moved and the motorist pulled it out of the trunk. A few seconds later, the deer bounded into the woods on shaky legs. Adams County Sheriff's Department posted the incident the next morning on its Facebook page with a photo of actors Chris Farley and David Spade in a car in a scene from the movie Tommy Boy with a deer in their back seat. Deer crashes into Georgia Applebee's runs amok in the kitchen. This article was featured on the UPI.com website and was written by Ben Hooper. An Applebee's restaurant in Calhoun, Georgia was temporarily closed after deer crashed through the window and ran amok in the eatery's kitchen. Joshua Baumgartner, a fry cook at the Applebee's restaurant on Highway 53 in Calhoun, said he and a co-worker were doing prep work Saturday morning when they heard a loud crash that sounded like glass breaking. The co-worker went in to investigate and discovered a male deer had broken through the window and was running toward the kitchen. Baumgartner told WAGA-TV he and his co-worker hid behind some garbage cans while the deer slipped and slid on the floor because it, quote, wasn't wearing its slip-resistant hoofs. The fry cook said he called 911, but the deer escaped through a back door before police arrived. A manager said there were no customers in the restaurant at the time of the incident, which left the deer without one of its antlers. We have been told that it's rutting season and that deer pro- had possibly seen his reflection in our window and thought it was another buck and charged it, Baumgartner said. Six Point Buck Headbutts, owner of Minnesota Deer Hide Business. This story was originally posted on the Duluth News Tribune website and was written by Tom Cherveni. A Six Point Buck headbutted a rural Wilmer, Minnesota business owner, jumped over counters, and tipped over boxes before fleeing out of the door in which he arrived on Wednesday. The intruder caused havoc at Johnson Fur on South Highway 71, where workers were in the process of handling thousands of deer hides harvested in the last two weeks. It was something else, said business owner Scott Johnson, who took a set of six-point antlers to his ribs and stomach. Johnson said he had a few tender ribs, but otherwise was okay. It all happened around 4 p.m. Wednesday. With warm weather, the front door to Johnson's fur business was wide open. Johnson said he was in his office when he heard a worker in a back room yelling his name. I thought he just needed something, Johnson said. He got up from his desk and stepped around the counter. Here it was, a big buck coming right at me, said Johnson, who's 67. After butting into Johnson, the deer dashed into the back room and jumped on the grating tables where hides are sorted and lots of paperwork were stacked. He proceeded to make mischief of it, Johnson said. He kind of tore the place apart before he got out of the door. At one point, it had even jumped atop a refrigerator. The Johnson's dog, a Jack Russell Terrier, barked at the intruder and nipped at its heels while Johnson and workers yelled at the buck invader. Johnson had been feeling nauseated that afternoon, and taking a set of antlers in the ribs and stomach didn't exactly help. He added, it woke me up, he said laughing. This is the deer rutting season, so Johnson said he can only speculate that the smells of the deer hides inside of the building may be what attracted the buck. If the buck wasn't lucky in love, the six-pointer was at least lucky enough to escape Johnson fur with his hide. After bounding out the door, the buck bolted right across Highway 71 and did not get hit by traffic. More deer on Staten Island must get vasectomies than expected. This story was originally reported on the New York Post website and was written by Mary Kay Ling. Mary de Blasio's controversial deer vasectomy program is up against a far larger herd than the city expected. White Buffalo, the Connecticut company that is tranquilizing, operating on, and tagging the animals, has been paid just over $2 million this fall under a three-year, $3.3 million contract. The experimental program, meant to rein in Staten Island's Randy Herd before it reproduces out of control, has sterilized 450 bucks in the island's southwest corner, according to the Parks Department. That means there are more than 2,250 deer in the area alone. The tally is three times the 763 deer counted island-wide in 2014 and rising. The city's vasectomy-only deer policy, a nationwide first, has been dismissed by wildlife experts as unfeasible. What's more, even sterilized bucks stay rubbed up throughout the mating season, which some experts say could continue for months if the does go into heat repeatedly, which will happen if they are not bred. As the amorous bucks chase females and fight each other, dangerous encounters with humans increase. 49 deer vehicle collisions have been reported on Staten Island so far this year, up from 31 last year, according to the Staten Island Advance. Of the 450 bucks sterilized, 13 have been killed by cars. That concludes this week's edition of the Big Buck Registry's Deer News. For links to the stories featured this week, please check our show notes at www.bigbuckregistry.com. And if you have ideas for any future topics or have questions about any of these topics, please email me at jim at bigbuckregistry.com. 
For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Thanks to Jim Keller for the Deer News. Without further ado, here's Neil Pendleton. Neil Pendleton, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. What's happening, brother? Oh, just excited to talk some deer hunting. All right. Well, you're in the right neck of the woods, I can tell you that. So, Neil, tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm actually from Maine. From Maine. Gotcha. Yeah. That would explain the 207 area code on your phone. That would do it. That would do it. So you're, so you're, you're from Maine, and you sent in a, a picture to the Big Buck Registry Facebook page, and, you know... I, one of my one of my little behind the scenes secret tasks. The reason I do have that Facebook page is because I'm looking for interesting content for the show, and the interesting content are the hunters themselves. And when I start to notice a pattern, or if I start to notice that there's somebody sending in a, a buck from a particular area that's a little unusually large for that area, then I know I'm talking to somebody that really knows what they're doing because that doesn't come easily. And you fit that mold exactly, Neil. So well, thanks for joining us. It's it's a pleasure to have you on. Well, thanks for having me. I've been a big follower of you know the Big Buck Registry's podcast. So I'm a huge fan, and it's one of those that it's you know helped improve you know my hunting. And uh, so it's one of those I'm honored to be on the show. Well, we're going to get along just fine then. All right, very good. Let's. Uh, t- so you're 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 from Maine. Tell us about growing up a little bit. What what was Maine like? Oh uh, well, for me, you know, growing up in Maine, it was a great experience. Uh, so I grew up, uh, you know, just outside of a coastal town in Maine. I grew up in the town of Belfast, and that's where I guess my hunting roots, you know, kind of started. Pretty much growing up, it was, you know, great to, you know, be with family. I had, you know, a lot of my relatives were all there. Grandparents were a close part of my life, in addition to parents and aunts and uncles. Uh, so it was just, you know, a real good family atmosphere growing up. And uh, I had, you know, the I guess the honor of being able to hunt with both my father and my grandfather. And they're the ones that really got me started in it at a young age. Very nice. I'm, I'm glad you joined us, too, because we've been getting a lot of requests from people to explore more of the Northeast style of hunting. And I know you hunt other places than just the Northeast, but I was, I'm was i excited to learn how you go about your deer hunting days uh, in New Hampshire because it is the Northeast, and there's a different style, and there's a different way about it. And I, I, I don't know what kind of styles you, you employ typically, but we're going to learn about that. Um, but I'm excited to talk to a fellow uh, Northeast hunter to, to learn how you go about strategizing for the whitetails up here. It's definitely a different, different strategy in a whole different world of hunting, that's for sure. You know, hunting, you know, whether it's the big woods or urban areas in New Hampshire where I hunt, it's one of those that's completely, you know, a different world. than I actually just made my first uh, trip, you know, to the Midwest and hunted in Ohio. So that's, for me, the first time I ventured outside of hunting the Northeast. That's where I've really gotten all my experience and honed my skills. So I grew up hunting in Maine. I started at age 11 uh, hunting, you know, with my father and, and grandfather, as I said, and, you know, learned a lot through them. And, uh, you know, whether it was sitting in stands with my father or doing, you know, a couple of small drives, you know, with pretty much my father and my grandfather and a couple of close friends. Uh, it's pretty much how I got introduced to hunting. And so it's one of those, there's not as many deer. Uh, the densities aren't quite there, uh, especially in New Hampshire. You know, I know a lot of the age structures aren't there. So it's for me trying to pursue big bucks. It's one of those that I kind of learned from my father, you know, seeing him, you know, pursue big bucks. Actually, the first morning I ever sat in a tree stand, uh, guys, it was um, back when I was 11 years old. My father and I climbed into a wooden stand that he had built on his property. And that morning, I remember we're sitting there in the stand, and he kind of said, hey, Neil, there's a buck. And he looked over his right-hand shoulder, and I'm sitting to his left. And sure enough, I can hear a crunch, crunch, crunch coming down in through, and I see him lift up the 30-odd six. And next thing I know, he squeezed one off, and that was within probably the first half an hour of sitting in the deer stand. My father had a big buck down on the ground. And for me, that kind of, I think, right from there, being a part of, you know, getting it out of the woods, bringing it back to the house, and being there with my father in a close moment like that, I mean, forever just, you know, grew the affinity to deer hunting for me right there on the spot. Nice. Is that your earliest recollection? Actually, my earliest recollection is kind of funny. Uh, my earliest one, because uh, in Maine at the time, you were able to start hunting when you were 10 years old. And so at the time, my father, you know, like I, I guess probably any father, had hopes and aspirations of his son, you know, falling in love with deer hunting and wanting to get out in the woods. And so when I was 10 years old, I didn't quite have, it, you know, the, the same passion for it at that, that age yet. So I remember we went for a walk out by my mother's house and my father, I think he had a 410 and I had a BB gun actually. And so we went for a walk 
and uh, there was a gray squirrel that happened to run across, you know, the path that we were on. And so I remember pulling up the BB gun to, you know, try to shoot the gray squirrel. And next thing you know, my father, um, you know, behind me, he's like, oh, Neil, shoot. And so I shot, you know, the squirrel. Well, kind of looking back, and I remember the BB gun sounded awfully loud that day. Uh, so it was one of those that, uh, at the time I didn't really think of it, but it, actually my father, I think had probably been the one who actually, you know, hit the squirrel, uh, for me, but it was one of those that at the time I thought it was me, you know, who got the squirrel. And so at that point in time, it was just, you know, a great experience, you know, being there, you know, it was my first, you know, accomplishment as a hunter with that squirrel. Um, but I remember it was one of those that that's the only time I've eaten squirrel in my life. But, uh, I remember, you know, my father said, Hey, you know, if you're going to go and, you know, take an animal's life, you know, you have to, you know, go and, you know, eat, eat what you kill. And so at the time, you know, we actually cooked up squirrel that night and something never done, you know, since, but it was one of those, I remember spitting out multiple, you know, bird shot pellets. <laughs> so that's where I was assuming my father helped me out on that one. So that's usually, that's actually my first, you know, hunting memory. No kidding. All right. So that, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. Getting, getting your first uh, bite of lead is not, <laughs> not the funnest thing in the world, but it's an experience we all have to go through. That's, but it's, yep. it's priceless, priceless when you're doing it with who you're doing it with. That's great. So what else was part of your foundation as a hunter growing up? Was there, were there other people that influenced your life besides your, your dad or whether you have uncles or friends that were into it? I was one of those that was mostly growing up was my father and my grandfather. Um, you know, both of them were who I spent most of my time hunting with. There was a couple other friends, you know, my father's that would, you know, partake in, in the hunts and pretty much it would be, you know, we'd sit in the mornings and evenings and then there would be that, you know, kind of, you know, gathering, you know, in the middle of the day where, you know, a few of us would get together and we'd go somewhere and a couple of guys would be on stand. And then usually, you know, my father, um, until I got old enough, you know, with either my father and him or my father and a friend would walk through the woods. I mean, it's myself and usually my grandfather who would be on stand and they would still hunt, you know, through the, through a piece of woods. And so that's what we would do in the middle of the day and then get ready to sit in the evening. Um, so pretty much, yeah, it was, you know, my father and grandfather. I had friends, you know, throughout high school who hunted. But it was one of those things that, you know, even back then and even still today, I kind of try to do it, you know, more so on my own. Um, and, you know, I always had friends, you know, who were successful, you know, just like myself all through high school. And we'd share the experiences and stories, but I didn't really hunt with a lot of other people, you know, than my family. Okay, gotcha. When do you, how old were you when you first went hunting outside of your family, like without your dad? Without your grandfather? Um, I mean, that would probably be, I mean, on my own, you know, growing up, it was one of those that, uh, I mean, you're allowed to, uh, you know, 16 years old, be able to, you know, take a hunter safety course before then. And then that way you can start venturing off, you know, on your own. And so that was really the first year, you know, that I had started, you know, on my own hunting. And it was one of those that I always had the success with my father's, you know, scouting and he put up stands. And so I'd sat in spots, you know, with him up to that point. So I knew that it was finally now it's time for me to venture out on my own. I wanted to try to, you know, get some of my own success and, you know, try to learn as much as I could and finally experience the woods. And my father, you know, was one of those that he had trusted me at the time, you know, to be able to, you know, venture off, you know, on my own and, you know, not have to, you know, be you know under his influence at all. And so then pretty much when I started hunting with some other friends and, you know, buddies was in college, you know, at that point in time where, you know, I'd go out, you know, friends and we'd get together and scout, you know, certain areas and, you know, hang stands and, you know, give each other advice. Um, but for the most part, I mean, something for me with hunting, you know, has really been, cause I'm more of a stand, you know, hunter, um, is, is usually been a lot of times solo. What was it like when you, when you first broke away? I mean, it was, it's, it's like, you're excited, but at the same time, your, your dad is your hunting buddy. Um, yeah, and it was, how'd you feel it was about one that? of those things. I was, well, one of those, I was very fortunate to have, you know, a great hunter and my father, you know, to learn from, uh, but it was one of those two that I always felt like in some ways I was, you know, in his shadow, uh, cause it was one of those that, you know, I would sit in his stands or stands that he had hung. And so most of the deer that I had gotten and most of the bucks, you know, I'd been fortunate enough to take had all been a result of, you know, his work, his hanging stand. So it was one of those that I wanted to prove, I guess, that I could, you know, do it on my own and, you know, find my own spots, hang my own stands. Uh, you know, and, and put the pieces of the puzzle together myself. So it was one of those that, you know, those those first, you know, few years, uh, I remember that, you know, there was one stand, you know, even though he had, he had set it up, I was probably coming from 16 or 17 at the time. It was one that, you know, we kind of abandoned, you know, down by this river and it was, you know, a long walk in, but I said, Hey, I think, you know, later in the season, I think that's the spot to be. And I remember, you know, going down in there and, you know, getting set up and had a nice eight point buck, you know, come, come charging in, you know, half an hour before dark to a little, you know, bleak can call. 
And so, I mean, that was one of those that I felt like, hey, you know, I kind of did that on my own. You know, I picked the time, the spot to go. And so there's, there's a lot of great memories there, but, you know, a lot of them, you know, throughout until I probably got to college and started hunting in New Hampshire, actually, that's, you know, for the most part when I really started, you know, going on my own. Gotcha. Now, hunting Maine, hunting New Hampshire, it's both Northeast territories. What do you think that there's a difference between hunting Maine, knowing what you know now, and hunting New Hampshire? I would say that there definitely is a difference, especially with the areas that I typically now hunt in Maine. Uh, my father, he has a cabin up in, well, I'll call it northern Maine to me, but it's a lot of people from Maine would probably call it more of a central slash getting into the down east type area um, near where, where Grand Lake Stream is. Uh, it's about an hour north of Bangor, and you head east uh, from that on the kind of borders of Washington County and Penobscot County lines. And so that's more, you know, big wood style hunting where you're, you know, going on a paper company land and you have thousands of, of acres, you know, to now, you know, just go and explore and roam. And, you know, and the deer are so spread out in pockets that some of their ranges up there can be, you know, seven, eight miles, um, you know, some of the loops that they'll do. So it's definitely a lot different hunting because the deer will roam a lot. So what what kinds of styles of hunting do you employ in, in the Northeast? Um, obviously, you, you know, stand hunting is probably a preferred method uh, in Ohio and, and down south. Uh, what styles do you use in New Hampshire and Maine? Uh, it's pretty much been stand hunting for myself. I try to find, you know, good locations and, you know, first thing in the morning and evening, uh, that's where I'll set up, you know, in a stand, uh, especially, you know, when I'm bow hunting, that's, you know, all I'll do. But when I do hunt, you know, up in Maine and do rifle hunting, and even in New Hampshire, I will, you know, walk around and do a lot of still hunting in the day. And so for when I go up to Maine, I mean, a typical day up there would be, you know, wake up hours early, um, you know, eat breakfast, you know, get all the gear ready, hop in the truck and drive somewhere to, to where I'll go hunt, you know, get over there, you know, well before it gets daylight and then try to get into a stand, you know, sit the first three, four hours of the day, get down, go back out to the truck you know, grab something to eat and then, you know, drive to a different location because there's, you know, you know, the vast amounts of woods to, to be able to explore and just find a spot that I want to, you know, just go in for the day and go for a long walk and explore and still hunt and, you know, see new ground or scout new areas that I think, you know, have great potential and then get ready to head back for the evening sit. So oftentimes when we're up at camp, I mean, we don't really even see camp at all, you know, during, during the daytime. It'll just be, you know, at night, we're pretty much coming back just to have a roof over our head because we spend all of our time in the woods. Gotcha. All right. That sounds familiar, doesn't it, Dusty? Oh, yeah, sure does. <laughs> kind of like <laughs> kind of like every time we get together, it's, uh, <laughs> you just spend the entire time in the woods, and then you, you come back after dark because you stay till the last light, and then you go grab a bite to eat and a beer maybe, and then you crash, and you do it all over the next day. So that's deer camp. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's definitely what it is. And so that's where, you know, comparing it to New Hampshire, you know, where I hunt, because in New Hampshire, it's one of those that I, you know, I'm in, and I am, I do live in southern New Hampshire, so it's more of an urbanized area. So it's one of those that you don't have quite the woods to explore, and you know, the deer don't travel as far the, the same track. So it's a lot more, you know, trying to use a lot of strategy and really trying to, you know, time it right, and you know, look at, you know, where the deer are and look at the influence of of, of hunting pressure, um, because it's one of those that I think one of the big differences I know for me recently going to Ohio for the first time was looking at. You know, the different laws and rules that, I mean, I know that we've, they've been discussed a little bit on the podcast, but for those people who haven't necessarily hunted New England, it's one of those that if, you know, land you know, is privately owned, unless it's, if it's not posted, it's as, you know, I guess common access that anyone has the ability to go and hunt it and use it um, for, you know, for hunting and, you know, to explore. So that's one of those that there's a lot of open land that's available. So it's pretty much all considered public for the most part. And I think that's one of those that between hunting pressure in New Hampshire, because there is so many other influences, so many other people that could go into a spot that you've scouted and put time, you know, into, it's one of those that, you know, that can completely change you know, on a dime. Every, all the, you know, summer research you've done using trail cameras and scouting to try to locate, you know, where you want to hunt. Gotcha. All right. So now this brings up an interesting topic because you're from Maine and it sounds like you're used to hunting the big woods of Maine. And is that kind of the, the style that you grew up on in Maine? 
yeah, I mean, it was, I won't call it necessarily, you know, huge woods where I grew up on. Uh, that was probably once I got, you know, into college is where I really started hunting okay. the big woods. Um, but growing up, even though it was, you know, more woods, you know, you could roam a lot farther. There wasn't as many, you know, houses. Um, it was one of those that I still consider it somewhat, you know, ur- urbanized. Um, but it was, you know, one of those that still, you know, big, big tracks of land that you could, you know, go, you know, several miles before hitting another road in some spots. Okay. And then come to Southern New Hampshire and, and <laughs> that's a big difference. Right? Yeah. That's a big difference. I mean, that's where you, that's where you're, sounds like you're hunting now and that's where you live. Southern New Hampshire yep. is much more grown up than even central New Hampshire and definitely more than Northern New Hampshire. There it's, there's commerce, there's most of the cities are found along the southern border uh, of of New Hampshire, and I would say that Southern New Hampshire, in a sense, looks a lot like Northern Massachusetts when it's all said and done. So, and you have houses that have been built around these this commerce area. Now, I don't know exactly where you're at, but it sounds like you're. I mean, you got to pick your spots. You don't have that many to pick from. And that was one of the weirdest things for me, Jay, when I first got started is that, you know, one, I'm used to big woods. And so the first thing I do when I try to, you know, Hey, I'm living this new area and where am I going to go? And when I pull up a map, where am I going to start focusing my efforts? And it was looking at on, you know, satellite images. It was where are the biggest pieces of woods where there isn't roads between there isn't houses. And that's where I initially focused my efforts, you know, was trying to find the biggest tracts of land which I quickly then learned is, isn't always the best place to focus your efforts for hunting because the deer can be spread out. They can be sporadic. There's usually also a lot of other hunting pressure in some of those areas. And mm. the deer will naturally gravitate towards the safer areas, which are near houses. And so that's where it was starting to look at, you know, all these different terrain features of funnels and pinch points. And also when you look and study maps, trying to figure out, well, where will other hunters may not be? Where is there not a parking lot? Where is there not a spot you can pull off on the road? And so it's trying to put all those pieces of the puzzle together to first figure out, you know, what's going to lead to, you know, a successful area without the influence of many others potentially kind of ruining your hunt. And so, when I, when I first started hunting down here, I remember, you know, tons of times I'd be, you know, up in a stand and here I am always in early, whether it's a half an hour, an hour before first light and get settled in and relaxed. And, you know, numerous times I'd see a headlamp come bopping through and it's almost daylight or actually daylight now. And here comes a headlamp, you know, walking on through of, an, of another hunter. Right. And so there's, there's definitely a, it's a, it's a whole different ball game. Definitely a different ball game. And how many hours did you put into scoping out the area on on maps, for example? Uh, I mean, it's one of those that I mean, I constantly, I mean, you know, looking at maps, and I mean, it's one of those that, in not only in the off season, but pretty much when I'm sitting, you know, in a deer stand, you know, during hunting season, it's one of those I'm always just you know, looking at my phone, sitting there trying to study and find, you know, different spots to go to, you know, different areas to scout, whether it's during the season, whether it's in the off season, because it's one of those that, you know, for me. You know, especially the last probably five years, you know, deer hunting has taken on such an obsession. I think, you know, not only in my life, but in many, you know, hunters' lives where it becomes, you know, a year round, 365 day, you know, endeavor. So it's one of those that, you know, I spend so much time looking at the maps and trying to find different terrain features and different pinch points and looking at, you know, how to access these areas and, you know, trying to look for whether it's, you know, food sources or bedding areas. And so it's, I mean, that's what I think really goes into it is trying to find some of these you know, places on maps and then I'll mark them down, you know, whether it's, you know, that same year or in future years that I have aspirations to go and check out and then actually walk through it and see what the woods look like. Gotcha. How many different hunting spots did you identify um, to the point where you'll maybe rotate through these spots? How many, how many do you generally hunt overall? Uh, well, now that I've been living here, you know, for longer in the area where, where I currently live, it's one of those that I have, you know, more and more spots, you know, that I've learned over the years, which I, I think, you know, really helps being able to hunt within somewhat of a proximity to where you live because you can, you know, put that time, effort and resources. And, you know, especially for me trying to, you know, target, you know, you know, large and short bucks, the use of trail cameras has been a huge benefit because it's one of those that, you know, I've heard time and time again is that you can't obviously, you know, kill a big buck if the big buck doesn't exist where you're hunting. 
And for Very me, true. it's one of those right. that it's, it's been, yeah, it's been trying to locate, you know, where there is, you know, larger bucks. And so whether it's through first, you know, trying to find, you know, previous years, you know, rubs, whether it's going in trying to find tracks, which I know, especially the use of trail cameras nowadays, it's one that I've found that's, you know, probably the best starting point is, you know, you, you know, nine times out of 10, a huge track means, you know, not only a huge buck, but something, you know, with, with a good rack. And so it's that level of maturity that, you know, that I'd want to go after. So that's where then once I've found the sign, it's then a matter of, you know, trying to deploy trail cameras to hopefully catch a glimpse, you know, of that, of that buck. Because normally where there's one buck, there's also oftentimes other good bucks in that area. Gotcha. How many cameras do you put in the woods? Well, I have grown uh, quite a large you know, array of trail cameras over the years hmm. to where I started you know, using them, you know, probably around, I don't know, 2008, 2009 is when, you know, probably started getting some of my first trail cameras. And so now I've pretty much lost count. Um, it's probably upwards of, so I'd say 30 trail cameras probably about now is what I have and what I run. Gotcha. All right. Well, speaking of, of tools and tricks that we use, I'm going to turn the mic over to Dusty. I'm going to have him go through your gear check, kind of find out what it is that you think are what, what's important to you and what's not. Uh, I'm going to let Dusty kind of run that segment. Neil, do you carry a backpack into the woods? I definitely do, Dusty. Well, any particular brand? Uh, well, just this year, uh, I've started using a Badlands backpack is the brand that I've now started using. Um, previous years, it was, you know, just, you know, whether it was a Walmart brand backpack, but, you know, this year, as I guess I've gone over the years, I've tried to get better and better quality things. And so that's where knowing how important gear is, I went you know, this year and decided on getting a Badlands backpack. Gotcha. Any particular reason why you went with Badlands? Oh, uh, well, one, you know, I had some friends who would use Badlands and had, you know, great things to say about it. But then, you know, the more I'd researched it and looked at, you know, the different Badlands backpacks, it was one that I just saw the durability, you know, the quality is there, you know, and all the features and the design is really meant for, uh, you know, hunters and especially the backpack that I am using in particular for tree stand hunter. Awesome. So let's take and pull the zipper back and tell us what's inside that backpack. Right, Dusty. Well, I'm actually taking my backpack out of my little hunting tote that I have here in front of me. So I'm actually looking at it now. So uh, I'm taking awesome. my Badlands. It's the, the tree stand backpack out. Uh, so one of the first things that I have actually on the outside is I have some of like, the accessory hooks that I use um, You know, to hang, whether it's a pair of binoculars on or before I put in a bow hanger. Um, I have some of the, like, if you're familiar with the hawk, bow hangers i like the hawk accessory hangers they're they're rubber the rubberized hangers that have like a little carabiner clip uh so that way i can clip them to outer loops on the the badlands backpack and then they also have where the threads of the screwing part are there's a there's like a little plastic cap you can screw that back into so that way it's not going to be poking around and you can just you know hang it off the backpack when you need to you can unscrew it to then put into the tree for the 2016 season um i ended up you know getting a you know, an, an ozone unit. So I have that. I have some other accessory hangers. I have, uh, I'm unzipping a pouch with a uh, Scott release is what I use. Um, it's the Wildcat release. It's a smaller, um, smaller release. So I like that. So that way I can, you know, get a, get a better anchor point. I feel, um, then moving further inside the backpacks, so there's a lot of compartments and pockets in this. I have a backup release. Uh, one of those that I probably overpack with a lot of my stuff, I always want to make sure that I'm well prepared when I get in the stand. Uh, so I have a backup release. I have a small flashlight. There is a SD card reader. Uh, so that way, if I usually I'll bring a digital camera, but I have like a little SD card reader um, that's you know plastic coated, um, that's waterproof. That if I ever want to upload pictures to my phone while I'm while I'm out in the woods, I can do that. Then I have uh, like a plastic uh, Ziploc sandwich bag with my hunting license. Um, then from there I have flagging tape, uh, so in case I need to, you know, start marking a blood trail. Um, I have inside my rangefinder with that's attached to a binocular harness because one thing that I found very important is that if I'm going to be using a rangefinder, I don't want to have to be fumbling and bumbling trying to figure out in what pockets it, what pockets it, it's in or to put it back in a pocket. So I started using last year a binocular harness to attach my rangefinder to. So that way it's always right on my chest. And if I need to use it, it you know, I don't have to put it away. It just goes right, right back to your chest. I have a grunt tube, a headlamp, 
a pair of binoculars. I have, uh, like, let me see what you else. Got like, you got like a cart you're hauling this thing in on? My goodness, you got more stuff in that backpack <laughs> and I got my whole arsenal. Yeah, I, I do have, you know, quite a few things. So I, I always like to be prepared. Um, and lastly, I think uh, I have my safety strap because a lot of times I'll do, you know, portable, you know, stand setups with whether it's, you know, a hang on tree stand or a climbing tree stand. So I have a, uh, a strap that goes around the tree to be able to clip into. Very cool. Wow. That's a full backpack. It definitely is. And so sometimes if I'm not planning on, you know, carrying everything into the woods, I'll use like a fanny pack type style, uh, you know, duffel bag, fan, you know, like backpack. So that way I can you know, just throw minimal accessories in there to be able to have what I need. Very cool. So we got into your backpack. Let's talk a little bit about what kind of camouflage are you wearing? So for camouflage, I use uh, different types of camouflage. Uh, being from Maine, a uh, big company that I that I you know really like to try to use as much of their products as I possibly can is LL Bean stuff. Um, currently, right now, um, actually the next couple of days going to be raining. I have a uh, LL Bean. It's like a Gore-Tex, you know, hunting pants and hunting jacket setup. Um, for other camos, I have uh, this year. I got some Sitka gear camo, um, which I, I really like. You know, the quality of that and some of the patterns. On some of the Sitka gear camo, I have other field and stream camo, different real tree patterns. Um, so I'm not really necessarily at this point loyal to one brand as much as, you know, I love to use the LL Bean stuff. So I just, you know, love the quality and their, you know, their customer service policy as well. That if you have problems with it, you know, being, you know, as hard a user of, you know, the stuff that I am, it's one of those that if something goes wrong with it, I know that, you know, they stand by their products, which is something that, that I feel is really important. Gotcha. Any particular pattern on that? Uh, on that one, it's uh, some version of real tree on, on that particular LL Bean stuff. Gotcha. Any particular boots you like to wear? Uh, so there's actually, I'd say probably three or four different main types of boots. The early season, I'll use like a small, uh, ankle style, like slip on rubber boot. Uh, so that way I'm still, you know, implementing, you know, the, the, you know, as, as less than as possible, I guess, you know, by wearing, you know, small, like ankle size, like rubber slip on boot. Then I use the Lacrosse Grange uh, rubber boots as it gets a little further along the season. They're also going into area where there's you know any type of you know swamp or any type of water at all. Uh, then I use LL Bean boots, uh, for especially when I go up in Maine. Uh, I'll use their Bean hunting style boots. Uh, I like the fact that on the bottom the soles they're not really you know heavy with I guess any of my boots that I wear typically. I want to be able to feel the ground when I walk. I don't like to have, you know, some, you know, big stiff tread that's there that I can't feel what I'm walking on. And then lastly, I'll use like uh, the muck boots, like the Arctic sports for when it gets really cold and I'm up in, up in Maine when it gets down to, you know, pushing zero and I'm going to be sitting for four hours and the toes are going to get numb. I like to have, you know, something, you know, it's good, substantial warm boot. Very good. What kind of bow are you shooting? Uh, currently right now, I actually have two bows um, that, that I'm using. Uh, I use an elite bow. Um, right now I'm shooting the impulse 34 as well as uh, a bow that, uh, Morse's sporting goods and Randy Gagney has actually set up for me. Um, using the prime okay. rise is also another bow that I'm using this year. So, um, of course, I know you guys know Randy. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Randy's a so. great fella and really enjoy talking with Randy. Yeah, I can see Randy leave for work every day around seven o'clock, uh, or eight o'clock when, as I look out my office window at my house. Yeah, so I know it's, you know, I mean, you know, he's, I mean, a great archery, you know, tech, and so I, it was actually, uh, this this year was the first time, you know, I, I got a chance to meet Randy, and he did a, you know, fantastic job setting up, you know, my bow for me, and so it's, it was one of those that, you know, it's, it's you know, an amazing bow, and so, you know, thanks to Randy and the great job he did, you know, setting it up, I've been enjoying shooting it all summer and, and using it this season. Nice. Very cool. What kind of arrows are you shooting? Uh, currently, right now, uh, I'm using Gold Tip Kinetic Chaos. Uh, cause I decided this year after you know, trying to learn as much as I can, you know, from hearing, you know, other people you've had, you know, on, on your podcast or, you know, doing as much research as possible to try to go with a heavier arrow setup uh, to make sure that I have, you know, more penetration. So that's where the gold tip kinetic chaos, you know, offers that, that heavier arrow. Very good. Any particular broadhead that uh, you purchased to tip it with? Uh, right now I'm currently, uh, even though I have not, you know, experienced the results of them yet this year, I decided to go with a fixed blade broadhead. So I'm shooting the G5 Striker right now. On previous seasons, I've always had great luck using the uh, the Grim Reaper. I believe it's the Razor Tip. Uh, and I've gone with both the 2-inch Whitetail Edition as well as the 1 and 3 8 uh, Edition as well. So that's that's more of a mechanical broadhead. Very cool. 
Very cool. Let's get into tree stands. What's your What's your favorite? A hang on, ladder, climber, or a ground blind? Uh, I haven't used the ground blind much. I do have one. For me, my favorite has to be probably. I would say the, the one that gets used the most right now would be my uh, my lone wolf hand climber. Uh, that's really for me, you know, being able to go into multiple areas, being able to, you know, you know, to climb trees and you know to sit a variety of different spots. That's probably you know my favorite. I use some of the summit tree stands if I want to you know be able to lounge out and be comfortable, especially if I'm gun hunting up in Maine to have that bar to be able to you know you know lean forward on and be a little bit steadier holding a gun is a big feature. Um, but I have just this season started to more of like the running gun type hang on setups, especially when I was down in Ohio to have climbing sticks, uh, and, you know, a hang on tree stand that I've tried to get, you know, proficient at being able to, you know, in a time efficient manner, set, set the sticks up, hang up, you know, put the hang on the tree, which lone wolf stuff really helps with, um, to be able to have that ease, that quiet ability. And that was another, I guess, getting back to the backpack key feature of that Badlands backpack is that. I can go in with all the gear that I carry. I can have a hang on on my back. I can have the backpack clipped into the stand and I can have the climbing sticks underneath that backpack because it has straps. And so that way I can go in with all the gear that I need. I can get set up um, and then take it all down and take it all out with me, you know, that same evening. Very cool. Very cool. Jay, you want to get into going on a memorable hunt? Absolutely. Now that we've kind of set the stage of how you like to hunt, what you hunt with. Now it's time to kind of put that to the test and take us on a hunt with you and, and really get down to the details of how this entire hunt unfolded. And I believe in our pre-show chat, I believe you had planned on telling us the story about the buck that you sent in to the Big Buck Registry Facebook page, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yes, uh, that that particular buck that I sent in, uh, that is a buck that for me, you know, they, they always you know use the saying, you know, hunt of a lifetime, you know, buck of a lifetime. For me, you know, truly, you know, I had the honor of being able to hunt a magnificent, you know, giant white tail buck for 1,490 days. Uh, so it's, <laughs> All it's right. five, five seasons, yes. So for me, that is, uh, that is a story that I would like to share. That's awesome. All right. So we're going to take 1,000, how many? 1, 490 days, yes. 1,490 <laughs> days and condense wow. it into the next <laughs> 25 minutes or so wow. and find out how this whole thing unfolded. This this might be the most epic tale we've ever had on the show, other than Jared Scheffler, probably. Um, but the, to have that much condensed down and that much time that went into one particular deer, this is going to be amazing. I'm, 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 I'm pumped to hear this story. All right, so where are we going specifically? Uh, well, it's, it's hard to even pick where to start, I guess, uh, but it's one of those, I think probably the first place to start is the first evidence that I had of a giant white tail existing right. in southern New Hampshire. Got it. So in the summer of 2011, I had gone and put out some trail cameras in an area that I believed to be a potentially good bedding area for deer. And so I found you know a nice thicket, and so I put out some cameras, and that summer, I had had pictures of just does and fawns. Uh, so then when opening weekend rolled around here in New Hampshire, it's September 15th. And so I'd been down there that prior week and checked the cameras and still just does and fawns. So I decided at that time to hunt somewhere else opening weekend, which was the decision for years that I really regretted. Uh, because on opening day, which was a Thursday in 2011, uh, I had pictures of this giant buck that came by opening morning, opening evening, and throughout the next Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, was there frequenting this area during daylight. And so that particular Sunday, uh, I had a friend of mine who had actually gotten a nice buck and we'd had another friend that came down. So of course, you know, we all have swapping deer stories. So we're standing around, you know, looking at the buck trading stories. And my intentions were all day just to go check that trail camera. I got to get down in there and see if anything, you know, has shown up yet. So, you know, of course I'm sitting there, I'm running late, I'm running late. I hop in the truck and I'm driving over there. Still the intentions to check that camera. And I'm looking at the clock and I'm thinking, well, uh, do I really have time to walk in there and check that camera? No, there hasn't been anything all summer. I got to get to my other spot and, and hunt that. So I didn't check in on Sunday. And then Monday during lunch break, uh, I'm fortunate, you know, to have a, a job that I work at that allows me flexibility um, to, you know, sometimes make my own schedule. And so I was able to take, you know, a longer lunch break that day uh, to go check the trail camera. So I walked down on the spot and 
I'm going through pictures, just, you know, scrolling through my digital camera right there at, at the side of the trail camera. And I couldn't believe what I saw. All of a sudden, I just see this giant buck. I mean, daytime picture, one of the most beautiful pictures I have ever seen broadside to where this I mean, this giant rack that went up. And I mean, at the time, I, I couldn't even tell you, you know, how many points it had. But it hadn't really broken into a non-typical rack. It was still very typical. But my jaw just hit the ground. I was weak at the knees and just starting to shake. So I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And then I started scrolling through the pictures to see how much daylight activity there was really got me excited. So the first person I wanted to call, of course, you know, was, was my father. And so at that time, I'm like, crap, I can't go and sit here tonight and hunt. I got to go back to work. And I was kicking myself at the time in the butt because I'm like, well, if I had been here and checked that camera like I intended yesterday, he came by about a half an hour, 45 minutes before, you know, I got dark out that Sunday, the day before. And so, of course, I always look back to, well, this story may not exist if I had checked that camera that Sunday. I mean, I may have been fortunate enough if, you know, the winds were correct and everything to be able to actually have a chance at, you know, taking an animal back in 2011, where then at that point in time, I think that's really the beginnings of the story is first getting picture evidence, you know, of, of this giant buck. Um, and that's really, I think, where the, where the tale began. All right. Well, it's, uh, that's okay. So that's a heck of a, a way to start. So you, you've got it, you, you know, it exists basically. Yep. That's all, you know, and you have an idea where it might be hanging out. All right. So what happens next? So next I went and I, you know, admittedly probably made some mistakes at that point in time. Um, because as opposed to looking at things like wind, looking at things like weather and really trying to come up with a better strategy, I just knew that it was time to hang a stand and time to start hunting. And it was one of those that I kind of let, you know, the pictures, I think, really get the best of me. And so that was a spot that I really didn't look at the bigger picture, I think. I kind of got tunnel vision and really focused on, you know, sitting that stand as much as possible whenever I could, you know, trying to get a chance to, you know, to get that buck in front of me. And it was an area where since it was near bedding area, it was really thick. And so I didn't have, you know, much of a, much of an opening to be able to see around the woods. I could hear stuff, you know, walking by and it was one of those that I started implementing a mock scrape at that point in time to try to, you know, get more pictures, um, which, you know, I did throughout that season of that buck and another, you know, pretty good caliber buck as well. And so was, throughout that season, I just, you know, essentially sat and sat and sat, uh, had a long, you know, a, a lot of, you know, long sits in the tree stand, just hoping, you know, for the chance for him to step out and seeing, you know, a lot of does, a lot of fawns, um, waiting for my opportunity, which never came in 2011. Um, I did have uh, a chance at that, that other buck, you know, that season, um, to where that was, you know, a pretty in intense story itself. But, uh, so it was one of those that, the, the plan A, I guess, you know, that year didn't end up happening, but there was a great consolation prize. So it was, you know, a, a positive end to 2011, but um, there wasn't going to be another year leading to 2012 with, with that buck still out there. Gotcha. All right. So you've got, so how, how many years has, has transpired so far? So this is just the first season. First season. Uh, so okay. we've gone through, yeah, 2011, I pretty much, you know, I'd say, you know, kind of over, you know, hunted a stand and really was just had tunnel vision in on, hey, this is where I got pictures and this is where I need to hunt. I know he's coming through and tried to sit, you know, primarily that location as much as possible. Gotcha. Okay. All right. All right. So let's continue with the story. So then in 2012, that's when I, you know, realized at that point I needed to try to, you know, expand, you know, the search and try to figure out, you know, more areas of where this deer, you know, could be and, you know, really find out more about, you know, where he was living and what he was doing. Uh, so that's where starting in 2012, I had trail cameras out and I got his pictures in May. Um, it was in the middle or early May when I first got pictures of a buck that I knew it had to be him. I mean, you're talking huge baseball bat size beams, you know, sticking out. Mm. And so I said, great, I know he exists. And at that point in time, I continued to run cameras, you know, in the area, um, the whole rest of the summer, never got another picture of him again. So opening weekend rolls around as much as I would love to sit, you know, an area where I had evidence that he existed. I just couldn't do it. So I hunted somewhere else and I wasn't going to wait the, the, the full, the full three or four days this time to go check the camera. Uh, so I think it was the following day I went back in to check a camera in that area and I couldn't believe it for the second year in a row on opening day, this buck walked by during daylight where I should have been sitting. I think in one of the pictures, you can almost see the tree in the background, you know, <laughs> where, where I, where I should have been in that morning with him coming by you know, 10 minutes after light. No kidding. <laughs> yep. 
It's like they they have a sixth sense. I swear to God. They they definitely do. So um, so throughout you know the 2012 season, you know I continued to learn more about them. You know trying to expand you know the areas you know where I hunted them. You know trying to figure out and learn more. Uh, and then the only other then I think real pictures that I got of him, um, you know, I got some throughout the season. It was actually late season. I had filled both my archery tags at that point in time, um, with, with taking, you know, some other nice bucks. And so then when it came down to the end of the season with a week left, um, of archery, cause once our gun season ends in New Hampshire, there's that week extra that archery goes. And so of course, like, as you said, he had a sixth sense for this. He knew, I think I was tagged out. He knew that at this point in time, all I had left, you know, was a doe tag in my pocket. Um, so, of course, he starts showing back up, you know, during daylight. And I was tempted, of course, to tell my father, get your butt down here. You know, we got to go and, you know, hunt this deer. But I was probably a little selfish, you know, at that point in time as well and saying, well, he'll be there next year. Um, so then, then it moves into to 2013 where I had done, you know, more of the same trying to expand, you know, the area of, of where I was hunting him. And this is where not only did it, I start to realize that I knew about him, but how actually widely known this buck was by, by many other people. Um, there was one day in a local parking lot, I actually bumped into a trapper that was there and he was talking about, you know, seeing this, you know, this giant buck, uh, cause he ran a trap line in that area. And so he had said, you know, Hey, I've seen, you know, this buck over in this area. So I started checking a little bit more over there, which was a decent, you know, amount of distance away, probably almost a mile and a mile and a half away from where, you know, the core area where I knew him to be. I started finding some nice rub lines, but I knew that particular area was really pressured with other hunter presence. So I didn't think there would be much daylight activity of this buck, you know, over, over in that area. Um, but I did, you know, continue to scout it. Um, and I actually bumped into another hunter that day, small world that has a cabin up in the same area in Maine that, that my father does. Gotcha. And of course we got talking about hunting and, um, you know, him talking about, you know, how hard it is to hunt in that particular area of Maine. And he started talking about this giant buck that was out there. And as he goes and starts telling it, my heart's sinking. So I'm like, wow, he's opening up to me and I've known him for less than two minutes. And he's just telling stories of this giant buck. And I'm like, how many other, you know, hundreds of people has he told this to that, that know about him? And the really cool thing was that he told me that he had his shed at his house. So when I learned he had gotten his, his sheds from 2012, he found one in his backyard. Really? I, of course, was excited, yeah, to finally put my hands, you know, on, on the bone, you know, fr from this buck. So... Um, after seeing, you know, his truck in the parking lot later on, later on that, I think it was that summer I had stopped in, you know, to, to chat with him and introduce myself a little more and finally got to see, you know, the antler, well, one half of the, the antlers, you know, from this buck that I'd pursued, you know, so hard now. Uh, and that was in, that was in 2013. Gotcha. All right. So we're a couple of years into this endeavor and yep, so this would be three, three seasons into it. Now. Okay. And there, there are people that know about this buck at this point. And other people are after him. Yes, there is a lot of other people that, that know about him, and a lot of other people that are af after him. And, and pretty much all the area around there is all open to, you know, hunting. There isn't any, you know, for the most part, any posted areas. So, I mean, any other hunters can go into any of these spots. And so the word is spread, um, you know, that there there is a big buck that's out there. And so there are other people who have gotten pictures of him. And so it was one of those that, you know, at this point in time, I was really beginning to learn that, wow, like, he's not just my, you know, secret. It's, you know, everyone else, you know, knows about him. Right. So that's where, and then also, you know, in 2013 is where, is where I had, you know, I, my first encounter, you know, with that deer as well. Right. Um, which that, that in itself was, was a pretty exciting experience the, the evening that I saw and laid eyes on him for the first time. So you've got the deer to hunt you've, and you're trying to outwit all the keen senses of the whitetail. You're also trying to outwit every hunter in the area that's after this monster. And that is correct. Yeah. What, what's going through your head at that point? How, how are you, uh, are you thinking that I've got a one in something chance to get this done? Or are you thinking like, ah, uh, probably it's not going to happen. Uh, no, I was always, I've, I've always been an optimist, optimistic person. So I was especially optimistic knowing that, you know, I'm very persistent. I'm very dedicated. And I, I mean, I would say that I put in, you know, probably more time than, well, I, I know I put in a lot of time than the majority of hunters that, that are out there. 
Uh, and so I think that's where, you know, for my first few seasons, you know, in, in this hunt, it was one of those that I think that kind of worked against me, you know, in some ways that I'd hunted, you know, so hard and put in so much time and so much effort that I'd thought that, you know, that's how I, in many ways I grew up hunting is that, you, you know, you got to be in the stand to be able to, you know, to get, to get a deer. Hmm. And so that's when I think for me, that's where the, the, the true, you know, lessons I started to learn where, you know, this deer started to teach me so much more that I had to step my game up and really evolve myself as, you know, a bigger buck hunter to say, well, you, you can't just always hunt harder. You got to start hunting smarter at some point in time. And that's really then, you know, where I started to, you know, to try to, you know, learn as much as I could and trying to, you know, whether it was, you know, listening, you know, to podcasts, reading books, doing research online, reading as many articles as possible, just talking to other people. I wanted to now, you know, try to figure out, you know, as much information as I could to even further myself as what I felt was, you know, a really accomplished hunter. But I wanted to make sure that I could try to, you know, I guess stack all the odds in my favor, knowing that there was other people that were after this buck as well. Gotcha. All right. So how did you start strategizing? I mean, you said you're learning things, but what what did you start? Piece. I mean, looking back now, you must have realized that some of those things that you learned must have clicked, and or maybe they didn't. Uh, what what types of things do you think helped you? Well, I, I really had to look at you know looking at an urbanized area. Well, how is this buck? And what is he doing? And why is he doing it? And why am I getting pictures? Where is he coming? Where is he going from? Which you know, it's one thing to get a picture, but now I'm starting to look at, well, what direction, you know, is he coming from? Why would he have been coming from that direction? You know, it's like, was it a, a bedding area? Was it a food source? What time of day was it? Was it evening? Was it, was it morning? And so those pieces of the puzzle is what I really started, you know, to go and look at and then look at the maps, look at the terrain features, look at warehouses were and look at, you know, why particularly on certain days would he have been moving through there to try to, you know, now really expand, I guess, the search for, for this deer's entire range to try to figure out with all the pieces of the puzzle how I could, you know, better stack those odds in my favor. Gotcha. Okay. All right. All right. So wh- where'd you go next with this this information? Uh, so then uh, at this point in time, uh, it was one of those that um, actually, well, that's where, um, well, actually in 2013 is where, you know, I had my, my first sighting. Um, you know, of of the buck, um, because it was one of those that, you know, some of the other things that I did was learning that when you're hunting, you know, in urban areas that, you know, you can't just be, you know, you know, tromping through the woods, you know, you know, laying down in a bunch of scent, you can't be, you know, jumping the deer. And so it's one of those that I would, you know, start, you know, going in really early, or I would sit, you know, later to make sure the woods had calmed down and almost turned over is kind of a term that I've used before to make sure that, you know, if with one of the areas where I was hunting, the first encounter I had, there was usually every night some does that would come by my stand and they would be headed from a bedding area to a food source. And so at one particular evening, as I sat, um, the does had gone by it was about 20 minutes after it got dark. And I was, you know, you know, anxious to get down and get back to my truck. And I remember hearing some, some light footsteps coming in and thinking, oh, I don't know if it's just a trailing fawn or, or what it is. And then sure enough, you know, here comes this giant buck, you know, 25, 30 yards away in the moonlight walking behind my stand Hmm. and just watching him for the first time and seeing him and catching a glimpse was just something that was magnificent and seeing the way he moved just with every step, you know, being thought out and methodical. And I kind of compared it to like an analogy of like in a movie, sometimes there's those action heroes who they don't seem to like, you know, like dodge the bullets. It's almost like the bullets are dodging the action hero. And that's the way he moved, you know, that night when I saw him for the first time, that he just, every step was, you know, precision focused. And then I think he knew, you know, almost that, that my presence was there, but knew that it was, it was after dark and there was, you know, nothing that could be done about it. Um, so that, right. especially seeing him just, you know, I think really, you know, lit even more of a fire. And so that's where then, you know, leading into to 2014, that's when I realized I had to, you know, you know, start using more cameras and really try to focus on, you know, doing a lot more summer scouting and try to, you know, learn as much as I possibly could. Did you feel at that point after seeing this buck, I don't know if you were silhouetted, sil- silhouetted in the moonlight or not, but it's, it's the, the feel I get. I don't know if that's what really happened or not. Um, but did you feel like you're like, were you saying to yourself, I'm, I'm getting warmer, I'm getting closer. I just got to put together the rest of this, this puzzle. Yeah, and that's where, you know, leading into, you know, leading into to 2014, I, I felt confident that, 
you know, once pressure started in the woods that I knew where, where this buck, you know, was probably going to end up. I knew where he, he was probably, you know, going to gonna head to, to try to avoid, you know, that hunting pressure, which, you know, typically when youth weekend comes around and then, and then once, you know, muzzleloader season starts after that, he would, you know, head for, you know, thicker cover to try to get away. And so I knew pretty much, you know, where he was headed. And so I kind of had it down to three phases, typically where his, you know, where his summer range was, where his early fall range and I kind of considered them one and the same and then where he would head, you know, during the heart of the season to try to, you know, get away from other people. And then come late season, he would then pretty much disappear. And I never, for the most part, really figured out, you know, after that, where, where he would go. Um, even when we got snow on the ground, walking around, you know, trying to find, you know, his track somewhere, he just seemed to completely, you know, disappear, whether it was, you know, hiding in between, you know, a cul-de-sac of houses somewhere where, you know, nobody would go and nobody would bump him and just, you know, you know, laying low. Um, I, I never really figured that out, but I felt confident that I knew where he would go, you know, during a certain time of the year, during a, you know, a few select weeks. And so that's where going into 2014, I really sat back and said, okay, I don't need to hunt that area. I don't need to go there because I know when he's going to show up and I'll have trail cameras that I can check every once in a while to finally figure out once he's arrived. And so um, that's pretty much exactly what happened. It was just right on script where in 2014, he had gone and showed up exactly where I wanted him to be at exactly the time I expected him to. And that was when uh, I actually, you know, saw him about a hundred, about a hundred yards away. I'd gotten down out of my stand one morning and uh, I was, you know, sitting, sitting near this bedding area and I ended up stepping on like a little twig when I got down out of my stand and I ended up hearing some movement out, out in the bush. And so I, I kind of, you know, hear this rustling around. I'm like, that sounds like a deer out there. And so I end up, at that point in time thinking, wow, it sounds like it's getting closer. Like, so I got my bow, it's, you know, already on the ground and I walk over to my bow, get my release back on and get ready. Cause it sounds like this deer is going to come up out of the thicket, you know, out in the open woods where I am. And then it sounds like, well, maybe it is getting further. And I look up and here he is a hundred yards away in an open part out in this thicket where I can see into it. So I'm kind of up on a hill. I can look down. I just see this giant rack. I mean, just massive set of horns. And I'm like, there he is. He was bedded probably 60 to 80 yards from my stand this whole entire morning. He was laying down right there. I was so close to him. And I grabbed my grunt tube, give him a couple of grunts, hoping that he'll you know, come back out towards where I am. And he takes a couple of steps towards me, stops, thinks about it, keeps on going the way he's going. I grunt again, stops, looks back towards me. And I do that three or four times. And then finally, you can tell he's going to lose interest. And he keeps going. Well, hmm. I found exactly where he's bedded, and I don't think he had a clue what made that noise, and he may at this time assume it's another buck. And so then uh, the next next couple of days, so I was getting you know trail camera photos of him in that area. I I ended up you know glassing with a set of binoculars down in that area and found where he was bedded. So I thought that once muzzleloader season started, because I'd be in better range than using a bow, that that was when I could finally you know go ahead and get him was opening day of muzzleloader. Gotcha. Uh, so I woke so I woke up super early opening day of muzzleloader, uh, snuck in on the backside of this bedding area to get to get set up somewhere else, and was in there hours and hours before it was going to get light out. And I come walking in, and this is when my heart sank, and I felt like I really just wanted to you know, throw up all over myself because I look, <laughs> and there's actually a camper that had a fire going at this point in time. Uh, I, uh, I don't know why this is in an area Jay that I wouldn't expect anyone to ever set up and go camping. I still don't know why they ended up doing this, but they're essentially in this thick area where why you'd want to go in there. I have no idea. And there's somebody that has a fire going and music playing and a tent set up <laughs> on opening day of muzzleloader. Awesome. On opening day of, of muzzleloader. Yeah. And wow. here it is, you know, probably two hours before it's even going to get light out. And I'm in there, you know, cause I, I want to get set up early. I want to sneak in, you know, you know, to the backside of the bedroom so I can, you know, get set up, have everything calmed down before he comes back to his bed. And somebody foiled my plans. And my first reaction is that I'm, you know, I'm just beside myself. And then I'm like, I can't even get mad at this guy because he is in a different way that passionate about the outdoors where he took it upon himself to, you know, to want to go out camping on Halloween night. Right. And so, so I ended up coming up to him and talking and, you know, I pretty much said, you don't kind of realize, you know, what you've done at this point in time. I was like, you know, first, are you a hunter? And he said, you know, no, no, I'm, I'm not a hunter. Uh, and so I, you know, said, Hey, 
there's been a particular, you know, buck that I've been after and he just kind of ruined it. And he's trying to tell me, Oh, he'll be back. He'll be back. And I'm like, no, you don't have a, at this time, the deer was nine and a half years old. Uh, Cause we had the teeth age and he ended up being 10 and a half years old. Wow. So that's where, yeah, at this point in time, a nine and a half year old buck isn't going to be back after somebody had a fire and had music playing all night in his bedroom. It's just <laughs> right. not going to happen. Right. Yeah. So, so that's where my 2014 season is kind of, I knew it because that's where I knew he was going to be. And, and I thought I had him, you know, I, I mean, I was confident. I was like, look, this is in a spot where, you know, at this point in time, I'm the only person that's setting up. I had seen him, you know, multiple times. I knew exactly where he's bedded and now he's going to disappear. And just like I thought he completely disappeared off the radar and didn't come back to that area during 2014. No kidding. Just like clockwork. Wow. Yep. So pretty much that plan got torched. Yep. But, but you're, you're learning like you're, you're, you're taking all the things that you knew about the whitetail and older bucks and you're, you're plugging it in. You're like, and you, I think what it did is it, Sounds like it's keeping you from wasting time and and getting focused on the next plan as soon as you possibly could. Yep. Gotcha. All right. So that ended the season. Yep. That, I mean, that pretty much, I mean, even though, you know, I kept hoping, you know, he'd show back up on trail camera, you know, in that area. I just yeah. pretty much knew that, you know, once that had happened, he wasn't returning you know, to that particular bedding area. There'd been way too much, you know, of a human intrusion there. Gotcha. So, um, so it was one of those that pretty much, you know, at that point in time, you know, had to, you know, for the most part, as much as I kept hunting, was hopeful and optimistic. I pretty much, you know, in, in my heart of hearts knew that 2014, it was going to happen, but by, you know, a chance of fate, everything ended up turning. And so it just wasn't going to happen that season. And so at this point in time, knowing that I've, you know, now, you know, been pursuing this, you know, huge mature buck for four seasons, I'm questioning, you know, if he's even going to make it, you know, to a fifth. Uh, and right. so that's where I was really hopeful. Um, but you know, once the 2014 season came to a close, I just had to sit there and wait the whole entire, you know, rest of your watching just days and months turn off the calendar, um, uh, you know, before I could, you know, get an opportunity, you know, to, to go back out and start, you know, really seeing, you know, visual evidence of him with, you know, trying to, you know, get trail camera photos. And so, right. That's where then luckily uh, in the summer of 2014, I didn't have to wait too, too long. Uh, in, in July, early July, that's when then I had, you know, the, the camera evidence. I don't think I actually checked it till probably the end of July or, or sometime in August. And I had his picture uh, where he was about a week in one particular area. I had, had, you know, quite a few pictures of him and not only had at this point in time you know was he still out there not only still did he have a huge rack he hadn't gone downhill he had changed from he started to go non-typical over the years but he completely changed into this huge palmated just bloom of horns that went straight up and particularly his left side completely just morphed into this crazy non-typical hmm. like bloom of horns and different than than anything you'd seen on him before yeah, I mean, in previous years, in 2011, 2012, it was more of a typical, you know, framed rack. 2013, 2014, the biggest change is you had a flyer drop coming coming out of the back hmm. where he had, like, this drop time that flew back and went down, okay. which was really unique and really cool. In 2014, he started to have, like, more of a, a thicker kind of palmation, you know, on, on that left side. But then in 2015, it just completely changed. Um, to where there were so many characteristics that were still the same, especially to where he had had a, like a big nub coming out in front of one of his brow tines that now turned into what is bigger than a brow tine. This I I can't remember the exact you know inches on it, but it was like almost 13 inches mm. of this you know huge spike that came up you know the front of his head and then had like another point that came out like probably another four inches sticking out of it. So it completely changed uh, his rack, but he had characteristics that you definitely knew, you know, it had to be him. What what was it, do you think, that caused the change in his, his rack? So this is where, looking back, uh, I'd always wondered by some of the ways that he would, you know, that he would move, you know, through the woods and the things that he would do is that obviously with the hunting presence that was there, you know, had he been injured, you know, had, had he been hit? And I had heard rumors in 2013 of somebody that may have, that may have, there was a giant buck that he'd seen that, you know, that he had a shoulder hit with an arrow and never recovered. And, and that's where in 2013, he seemed to, you know, kind of disappear as well around that time. So I wasn't sure if he'd been injured in the previous year, but looking back on, on it, when it came time to you know to butcher the deer up and removing the hide, we did find that embedded at the base of his neck, 
um, in between the neck and the shoulder blade area, there was a piece of like a copper slug uh, that had been found in, in the deer that had been there for quite some time. So okay. that is one of those that, yeah, th- that could have led to it. And I still have pieces to this day, you know, of the bullet that, that we had pulled, you know, from, from this buck. Wow. That's crazy. Wow. <laughs> so the legend was true. Yep. It was definitely, I, the only thing is I think back to that, I couldn't imagine being that guy. <laughs> no, what a bummer. <laughs> <laughs> I said, so this is a story that guy could probably tell, you know? Right. Gotcha. Yeah. Right. So where do we go next? Uh, so then, so with 2015, after getting pictures of him confirming he's still out there, he, he's still roaming the woods. Um, it was one of those that I, he was in the, an area where I hadn't, you know, necessarily spent as much time. And so I was assuming, okay, this is kind of, you know, phase one where I theorized he was going to be, uh, there was, you know, some more, you know, hard crop, you know, feed that was over in that area, the hard mass stuff. And so I said, well, early season, that's probably where he's going to be. And so I was hunting him, you know, over there, didn't see him, was seeing a lot of doe activity, but the pictures I was getting him was early in the morning. And then in September, I started to get more pictures of him, uh, you know, along, along the edges of this, of this field. And that's where I was starting to see him in the, kind of end of September there. And so it was good to just keep getting more pictures than I'd ever gotten of him, you know, and seeing almost on a weekly basis, like, you know, just, you know, camera evidence, he's still out there. This is what he's doing, waiting in kind of for that time when hopefully he was going to move into the same area where I knew once pressure picked up in the woods, youth weekend came around the gun hunters, the shots were going off. So he would probably start ducking into and actually a little ahead of, ahead of schedule than what I expected. I was thinking I may have to wait more until muzzleloader season um, to start, uh, even though I wanted to, you know, get him with a bow. That's when then on, it was October 9th, 10th, and 12th, he moved back into to that kind of bedding area where I'd focused my efforts before, and I had pictures of him showing up in that area. And so I can't remember exactly when, what day I checked the camera, but it was, you know, probably around the... I'd say 14th or 15th is when I had checked that camera. And not only was he down in that area again, but two of the times were during daylight that he was working the scrape that I'd put out because that was something oh, wow. that I'd really put in my arsenal was trying to, you know, put out mock scrapes to where this was a scrape that I'd started back in 2011. That was no longer a mock scrape. I didn't have to touch it or do anything. The deer had just taken it over and, and they would use it year round actually. Mm. And so at that point in time, I was really excited and I said, well, I'm taking a step back and kind of looking at this and saying, well, what have, what mistakes have I made in previous seasons? Well, you've jumped right in, you've hunted. And so, well, you know, he's going to be there. You know, he's not going anywhere until, you know, something changes. Hopefully, you know, there's not going to be another camper that's going to come back and start another fire in his bedroom. Like that's, that was a one in a trillion odds. So it's, it's not going to happen again. So now let's look and wait for the right weather pattern. And so looking at the, the extended forecast, I saw a cold front coming in. Mm-hmm. And I knew that that was going to be the best odds of him being still up on his seat, you know, during daylight. And so there was the weekend coming up where the only time for the most part I got in pictures of him is when the temperatures had dropped into the 40s. Okay. And so knowing that the cold got him up on his feet and got him moving and staying up longer and oftentimes during daylight, that's when, you know, it's going to be the opportunity to hunt. And so that's when actually that weekend, my father, knowing that I had a really good feeling, and my gut said, if it's going to happen, this is probably going to be the weekend. And so he had driven down from Maine, um, you know, to be there and be a part of the experience. And so we had hunted, you know, a couple of areas around the fringes, you know, some tinker stands, I guess, you know, as I'll call them. And then finally, that morning rolled around uh, Sunday, October 18th, and I got in, you know, to the, that stand. Uh, you know, really early and that's when I'm set up and it just, it had that feeling. It was cold, it was crisp. And I said, I, I hope he's still out there roaming and he's going to come back, you know, to the scrape before he, before he goes back to his bedside. And oh, probably, I don't know, I'd say 20 minutes after it got laid out, I'm sitting there and I heard that snap that we all want to hear. The one that, you know, it's not a squirrel, you know, it's got to be a deer, that twig snap, that branch break. And it just, yep. You don't guess. You just know it's a deer. Right. It's something. Something's gonna happen. And so when that branch broke, I'm you know I'm looking. I'm looking. I'm looking towards the sound. And it's you know thick in the area where I am. And I look up, and then all of a sudden, yep, I see a body moving, and it's a big body. Hmm. And then sure enough, there's the visual confirmation I needed. That giant set of horns, and That's it's it. him. And my heart starts to race, and the adrenaline starts to surge. But as soon as my heart started to race, and as soon as the adrenaline started started to surge, I also had the kind of calm feeling overtake me where it's like, this is finally going to happen. Like he's here. 
The wind is blowing directly in my face. He is coming towards me, and he's doing just the, the classic J-hook right now. He's going to come down beyond the scrape. He's going to get downwind of it and J-hook it and then go to work the scrape. Yep. And, and he's coming in, and he's walking down through. And as he comes down, I'm like, well, how far is he going to go before he J-hooks? That scrape is probably 30 yards out and out in front of me, and I'm set, set back off it. And he comes down about, now I'd say, 10 yards in beyond it, and he's still off to the right of where the scrape is. He comes down, he starts to J-hook, and he comes towards this little opening. It's probably like an old, like, grown-up, like, you know, tote road or something like that, you know, in front of me. And he gets towards it, and he starts to hook. And that's when then I'm like, okay, he's, he's going behind some trees. My bow is on a hanger. It's, it's sitting sitting right in front of me. And so, I mean, it's, it's right there already, right at perfect level. I don't have to turn around. I don't have to reach it. I don't have to stand up. I can stay sitting down. And, you know, I have my hand on the bow, get my release clipped in, and his head goes behind a tree, and it's time to draw. Like, this is finally going to happen. And as I go and draw, his, head, his head's behind like a, like a tree right there. There's a little bush in front of it. And he steps out, and the rack's there, the head, the neck, the front shoulder, everything is out in the open now. He's probably about... 20 to 25 yards away i mean right there up close and personal and i go to full draw and he stops where i have about an inch behind that crease in that front shoulder Mm. and i said i have not waited this long to not have him take that last half a step to make sure that i do this deer justice and i don't want to hit a shoulder bone i want to make sure that you know that, that i make a good hit on him right and so I remember at this point in time being so calm and just, you know, going through the memories of five years, all the time and effort, you know, put into it that I was like, you know what, I can just relax. And so I actually took like, you know, the, like the, the knock point, you know, away from my face kind of held it out the side. I'm at full draw still, the cam sitting down on my knee in front of me. And he, he's looking, you know, kind of back towards that scrape. So he's not looking towards me. Wind's blowing my face. And so I know I got time. I just sit there at full draw for probably in reality what's probably over a minute, maybe even two. And I'm just sitting there holding and waiting. And luckily I have a bow that has an amazing let off at this time. And so right. I just, I know they don't have to worry about it, you know, jumping on me. And finally he takes that last half a step. He's still looking towards that scrape. And I said, all right, now it's time to do it. Line up everything. I went through that checklist, make sure the peeps lined up with the housing of the site, make sure, you know, you got the string touching your nose. And I just went through that whole checklist saying, don't rush it. There's no need to rush and put that pin a little further back, probably than what I should have, because again, I just didn't want to, you know, get caught on the shoulder. I didn't want anything to go wrong. I said, I know that if I, you know, get him back further enough, you know, I'll be able to recover this deer. And so uh, I ended up putting that pin mid body behind the shoulder, let it fly saw the arrow go in, I, you know, had a lighted knock, knocks lit up, confirm hit, he takes a couple of, you know, stupers going off towards the thick stuff, kind of bounding forward, he circles about 30 yards off to my side, the arrow's still in him, and this is part of why I went with a heavier arrow set up this year to make sure this never happens again, that the knock is still sticking out, I can still see the arrow in him, and he stands about 30 yards off to my left in just thick cover. So there's no way I could you know, get another shot at him. Yeah. And I'm thinking he's going to, he's going to go over. Like he's going to go down. He's standing there at 30 yards and I'm watching this happen. And now, now it's hitting me like the emotions, you know, coming in. I'm not quite as calm as I was before. And I'm like, it's, it's a great hit. Like go down, go down. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to watch him drop. And then he walks off. <laughs> of course. But he still did. at this point, yeah, of course. He, he walks off, you know, it's been this long. Well, why would he not, you know, walk off at this point in time? Right. So that's where, you know, I, I go and I get down, you know, I, I meet up with my, I meet up with my father. And I said, look, I'm going to go back after wait a little bit, you know, and I'm going to, you know, follow the blood trail. So, so I went back in and my father, you know, kind of, you know, he held back for, for a little bit. And so I went in and I remember when I ended up walking in, you know, there was good blood in the beginning. I went down to, to where the deer was and, you know, sure enough, I look up and there he is, you know, laying down, non-typical side sticking up. And I know I told him, told the story to some of my buddies, like I would have thrown my bow at this point in time and running towards the deer, like, you know, seeing him down on the ground right. like that. And I'm looking, you know, he, he doesn't look like his chest cavity is moving, doesn't look like he's breathing. And I'm like, all right, let me just, you know, rustle a couple leaves here. You know, I'm 40 yards away, you know, all right, I think he's done. And all of a sudden, I take a couple more steps, and I, I, you know, I'd gone and drawn when I saw him down. I let back down, and at this point in time, he jumps up to his feet. He takes a couple of bounds. Next thing you know, he's up on, you know, he's up in a bush, up on the knoll, looking back at me. 
the arrow is still in them and I can see it's in, in a good spot. I'm thinking, how, how, is, how is it still happening? Like, how did I just, you know, jump, jump this buck? Like this can't even be happening right now. Right. But I remember him looking back at me and looking at him. And it was just one of those, that, that moment frozen in time where we're locking eyes and it's just like, I'm looking at him being like, wow, this is one of the last things, you know, that, that he's probably you know ever going to see. And I just, I wanted to give him like a glimpse of almost just respect and admiration. Like, you know, it's like, I, I can't tell you, you know, how much looking at you standing on that hill. It's like how much I owe you to make me, that you made me a better hunter and how much time and effort's gone into this. And, right. you know, being 10 and a half years old, like how much respect, you know, I have for him. And so, um, there was nothing I could do. I couldn't draw. I couldn't get another arrow on him. I knew the best thing that I could do at that point in time was, you know, pull out longer. And so, you know, I, you know, pulled out, met up with my father. And then we waited, you know, a few hours at that point in time, went back in, and then we, we started, you know, the track at, at that point in time. And it was some, some thick stuff. And we looked around for a while to the point where my father had almost stepped out, stepped on at one point in time. Um, and so I thought I heard something move. And so I kind of said something to my dad. And so he turned around. And then you're talking like another probably hour later, we get back to that spot. And I'm like, well, this is where we kind of had, you know, last blood. He's got to be right here, but it's hard to follow blood because it's so thick. I mean, we're getting caught up in, in you name it, just, you know, the thick, nasty raspberry bushes, you know, you know, whip trees. And it's just, it, it's thick. So yep. finally at that point in time, I get to where, okay, he's got to be over here somewhere. He hasn't gone far. I mean, this isn't like we're tracking miles. We're talking, you know, hundreds of yards. It's just so thick. And so right. finally I get to the spot where I'm like, look, my dad was rat last year. There's like a little bank that kind of drops down and he was standing here, but then he turned around and looked at me and I get to that bank and I look down and there he is. So I just, he's laying down. The, the rack is there. Like I just see it. And at that point in time, my arms go up in the air and my dad turns around and just gives me a huge smile and, that's when it kind of that sad feeling also, you know, overtook me. I was super right. proud. I was super right. happy, but knowing that, you know, that animal is not going to be out there, you know, a- anymore that somebody who's been almost like a friend to me for, you know, for five seasons now, you know, it was, it right. was finally over it. You know, the story had, had ended and probably one of the coolest things about it, you know, knowing how much time I'd spent, you know, with my father growing up, you know, Jay is that the first deer when I was 11 that I, that I'd ever gone, you know, and, and, and killed. Um, it was a four pointer last day of hunting season. Uh, when I was 11 years old and as we're bringing it out, it starts snowing the first time that year. And I don't know if you re- you remember, um, back to last season on October 18th, mm-hmm. the first snow that we had was on October 18th last year. I don't know if you, if you got that up where you were. I, um, I don't recall it exactly, but I know we got, you know, uh, a foot on October 31st. I think it was, uh, yeah, this was, ago. this was just, this was, yeah, this yeah. was just, you know, some, some spit and snow, but mm-hmm. yeah, it was one of those that once we're finally, you know, we got them loaded up. I have a cart, you know, that, that I use and we're dragging them out on the cart. And we finally got to the point where it's now easy going, We've gotten out of the thick stuff, you know, we're on the, we're on a trail and we can you know head on out. I remember looking up and like, you've got to be kidding me. It's like a blue sky day. Wow. There's, there's snow coming down. Like there's, it's spitting snow and it's October 18th. And like, well, you know, what, what is, what's going on now? It's like, and I'm like, dad, remember the first year, you know, that, that I'd ever, you know, gone and taken, remember that when we got back out to the gravel pit, started to snow right. and it's doing the same thing again. You know, it's like the, the, the best year of my life, one that I'd put more time and effort into than anything. It's now doing the same thing. I got to share it, you know, that moment experience you know, with, with my dad too. And so that was, that was a really, really cool moment at that point in time. It just seemed to, you know, kind of put, you know, the icing on the cake, if you will, you know, to a, to a great experience and, you know, just, you know, just added to the memories. That's awesome. What a great story. Unbelievable. Just fantastic, Neil. Wow. That is a great story. It really is. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those, I, I hope, you know, I told him, well, I'm, no, I'm sure I left out a lot of details because there's so much that goes into, you know, to, to that long, you know, of a hunt. And, you know, I mean, the people that I met, I mean, the, the doors that I knocked on, the houses of, you know, you know, people who lived, you know, in the neighborhoods, you know, telling of the story of a deer that lived in plain sight to them, right? To the non-hunters, he was brash, he was bold, he, you know, he eats plants in our yards, and, you know, there's, we've seen this huge buck for years, right. and then to us as hunters, he was elusive, he was a ghost, and, you know, he would be, you know, not, you know, he just wouldn't exist, and then, you know, to finally, you know, complete that, it was just, it, wow. it was just amazing and something that, you know, if, if he hadn't been, you know, a big body deer, if he hadn't been, you know, as big of a rack, you know, as, as he was, you know, it was one of those that it wouldn't have mattered at that point in time if he had spikes on his head. It was just, you know, I felt that I owed it to the deer to have, you know, that memory, you know, to have his story, you know, go on because for, you know, a buck of that nature to live to 10 and a half years old in such a heavily hunted area, 
and survived, you know, for that long. It's like to outsmart, you know, all the other hunters, you know, that that, that had been after him. I mean, it's just, you know, he, he was an amazing animal and probably one of the smartest deer that, you know, that, that I've ever encountered. That's awesome. Wow. Mind blowing. That was a great story and how you condensed it. I got to ask, and this, since you'd said it, it's been on, the, I have to ask this question. Tell yeah. me, tell me about your mock scrapes. What do you do? How do you say, how do you, I mean, it, something worked. So, and you know, if deer are using this, this one scrape or a, the scrape that you made and they go to it every year, you must have done something special. So tell me about your mock scrapes. Cause I, I guarantee every, other people are thinking the same thing. So I've used a lot of different stuff with mock scrapes. I've tried through a lot of different trial error, you know, different things, different approaches. So I guess to start off with a joke, I think the number one ingredient that goes into making a good mock scrape, for me at least, is using some Pendleton pee, you know, to where, (laughs) 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 so I've had friends and buddies, you know, have asked me, like, what is your secret to mock scrapes? And I say, it's Pendleton pee, you know, it's, I I can start selling the stuff, I'll bottle it for you if you need me to, you know, it's uh, it's a, it's a renewable resource. Uh, Right, right. So, but I mean, honestly, with the mock scrape, something that's been, you know, a great success to me, I think I heard statistics once that, you know, it's like with mock scrapes, you know, bucks will visit them. It's like, you know, only 19% of the time during daylight. Well, that's a 19%, you know, odds in our favor that it, there's going to be a buck there versus not. And so I'll take a, you know, a, a, you know, a one in five chance over a 0% chance any day of the week. And so when I started using these mock scrapes, what I found is, is that, you know, most mock scrapes have a licking branch. They're going to be, you know, the primary ones, not just, not just ones that land down, you know, as they go, like when we discussed, you know, some of the pre-show stuff, you know, tonight walking in, you know, I found a lot of scrapes to a spot where I was checking some trail cameras and, you know, those are probably just young bucks just going along, you know, just digging up the ground and, and you know, pawing it up where, you know, to me, a primary scrape needs to have a licking branch. And so I've tried whether it's, you know, you know, spraying scrape smells in it, whether it's using, you know, buck urine, whether it's doe urine. I've tried a lot of it. And I think the, the, the biggest thing is probably that fresh dirt smell is one that they get a visual. They see the ground, you know, that's been scraped up. There's a licking branch there. So it's just irresistible to, to come and, you know, put their horn, you know, their horns in it and start, you know, getting some of that preorbital gland, you know, up in that branch. Right. Um, and then from there, you know, for them to, you know, to, to urinate in it, you know, to put, you know, their interdigital glands, you know, down in that scrape, um, you know, I think it just becomes something that they need to do. And then after, uh, you know, other deer have done it, they want to, you know, keep doing in that same area. So it becomes, you know, that, that answering machine, you know, or that voicemail, you know, in the woods for other deer. And so that's how I've gotten a lot of pictures on trail cameras by using mock scrapes. And so sometimes I'll just, you know, whether it's with rubber boots or just grab a, you know, a stick, you know, and dig up the ground and make sure there's a branch there, which typically up here in the Northeast, it's hemlock, I think is probably the preferred, um, yep. you know, that I've seen for licking branch that works really well. I've seen, you know, oak trees work, but for me, it's, if I find, you know, a, a good hemlock branch that can overhang, that's going to be, you know, probably the key to then you know, digging up a spot and getting that fresh dirt on the ground and, for me, it works great because you have a spot where a deer is going to stop in close proximity to a stand. They're going to check that area out. Plus, you, if if I'm going to one thing that I found well and heard that deer can't tell the difference between human urine and you know and deer urine, it just turns to an ammonia smell after so many minutes. And so that's where it's also great to, be able to re- relieve yourself before you get in the stand. Um, and so you have an area that you can do it that's in close proximity to the stand. And it's, it's led a lot to, you know, my success hunting in and around scrapes and also just to get inventory and pictures, you know, of different deer in the area. Gotcha. All right. Very, very good. That's awesome. So such a great story. And, and thanks for sharing that, that detail on how you build your scrapes. I think that so I haven't not done a lot of the, the mock scrapes, but I think I'm going to use more of them now. It's an interesting concept. Yeah. And I just started uh, this year. I've been tinkering around with um, using uh, like I know there's a uh, guy, uh, Smokey, he makes, uh, I think he's from, I can't remember if it's Virginia, maybe the hills of Virginia somewhere. There's a guy, Smokey, that he makes. Um, it's a brand of scents. Um, and he, I guess, grew up you know, as a trapper, I think, if I'm remembering the story correctly. And so as a trapper, I mean, their livelihood, you have to be good with scents. You can't have you know, a lot of human odor contaminating it, you know, because you're trying to you know, outsmart, you know, predators. And so for him, um, he started to, you know, to bottle um, pre-orbital gland, um, but you can put on the licking branches, mm-hmm. which one big thing that I've noticed on licking branches is that 
they almost like chew that branch. Have you have you ever seen that, Jay or Dusty, where they, they chew kind of the end of the branch and the bark's mm-hmm. like removed? Right. Yep. yep. Definitely. Well, what it does is when they put that orbital gland, I guess, on it, they're getting that scent on it. It absorbs better into a branch without the bark on it, which makes sense, right? right. That, that barks is, that, yeah. you know, that, that outer shell is preventing that scent from seeping into the wood. So that preorbital gland, which the, the stuff that I just started using this season, which I've seen, I've seen it results. I actually have um, in one location, there's been two bucks that are, you know, probably two and a half, you know, year olds, maybe one of them is a three and a half year old, um, you know, not super mature bucks yet. But the two times I put it out that evening, they came to the scrape and they actually fought in front of the camera. I have I have one series of videos. I probably have 20 or 30, 15 second video clips of them. They start off, you know, just, you know, kind of nuzzling each other, you know, two young bucks. Then they kind of start, you know, the little pushing match and shoving. Then they start actually, you know, fighting in front of the camera. And it's, it's definitely one of those that has seemed to work that pre orbital gland. It's that sense they can pick up on. And then when it's at, you know, a scrape location, we'll just drive them nuts. Gotcha. All right. Very, very good. Well, Neil, I I think it's time for the 10 rapid fire question to get to know you a little bit better. um, If you're ready for them. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. Shoot. Dusty, go for it. Neil, first question. Best hunting tip of all times. For me, probably the number one hunting tip that I could give anybody is put your time in. I, I think, you know, for me, you know, growing up is that, you know, persistence, you know, paid off time, time in the stand and that you learn a, a lot just being in the woods, whether you're sitting in a stand hunting or, or walking around. So it's just, you know, put your time in. It's, uh, I think, probably the number one thing. And, uh, you know, other than being out in the woods and putting time in, it's just talking to other people and getting a chance to, you know, learn from, you know, other probably more accomplished hunters than yourself because, I know that was something that I tried to also do, you know, growing up a little bit was to surround myself, you know, with, with other, you know, really accomplished hunters. Great tip. One thing that you feel lost without going into the woods. Oh, I feel lost without, well, I mean, other than obviously some of the obvious stuff, you know, like, you know, your weapon that you're going in with. Right. right, um, right. You got a lucky charm or something that you can't go to the woods without. So yeah, obviously being a follower of this podcast, the, the lucky charm type thing is probably for me, it's, it's, this may sound kind of, kind of weird. Um, obviously, I've heard some people share some weird stuff on this podcast, but for me, it's probably uh, my grandfather's handkerchief, actually. Because um, for me, it's like one of those, you, know, you get in the woods on a cold morning, your nose runs, right? right? So it's one of those that I actually have, you know, my grandfather, um, who, you know, he, he's no longer with us now, but uh, it was one of those that I, I remember I got given with my grandmother a bunch of, you know, a bunch of his stuff. And, you know, one of the keepsakes was, you know, some of his, his, his you know, his handkerchiefs that he used to have, you know, growing up. And so it's one of those that knowing that I, whenever I go in the woods, I like to have something to blow my nose on a cold day. I've always had one of those red, red handkerchiefs with me. And that's something that for me is, is always been a good luck charm that I, that I keep with me. And it, it's just something that I always want to make sure I have when I go in, when I go in the deer woods. Gotcha. What's your biggest pet peeve? Huh, biggest pet peeve. Um, I mean, probably what most other hunters would say is probably, you know, other hunters, I guess. Uh, I mean, even though, you know, I try to, you know, have an understanding, you know, for other hunters in, you know, knowing that, especially when you're hunting, you know, public ground, that they have just as much right to be there, you know, as I do. Um, but it's one of those knowing that, you know, the time and effort, you know, that, that goes into sometimes scouting and finding a good area, you know, we have other people, you know, that show up or, you know, or go through it. Um, that's one of those frustrating things I, I would call it more, more than, you know, necessarily a huge pet peeve, but uh, other hunters, I guess. Gotcha. How old are you, Daniel? Uh, today I'm 33. 33. So what would the 33 year old Neil tell to the 20 year old Neil knowing what you know today? Tell to the 20 year old Neil. Um, I would say probably the most important thing that you can do is just to, you know, try to, I mean, really, you know, learn as much as possible you know, continue, you know, to follow your dreams, your aspirations. And, you know, I guess just, you know, I, I mean, I don't know, I guess try to, you know, really learn as much as possible and, you know, experience all the things that, that are out there because, you know, looking back and one thing you don't want to do is regret, you know, things in life. And I think we all, you know, have, have regrets. And so trying to live life to the fullest and really make sure that you can, you know, learn and take in as much experiences, you know, as possible is, is probably one of the biggest things. And so something that I think that I've done, but there's certain things, you know, looking back that, you know, you want to make sure that you always make, you know, the right decisions and do the right things. So um, that's mm-hmm. probably, you know, the only advice that I could give. And, you know, from a hunting standpoint, I would say just, you know, hunt smarter and not always harder is probably, is probably the thing that I tell the 20 year old Neil. Right on. You meet a stranger at uh, a convention, a hunting convention or 
in the elevator and they ask, what do you do for a living? What do you say? Uh, I would say that I am a health fitness manager and I run, uh, I run an all women's uh, gym. Uh, it's, you know, personal training and nutrition. So I, I would say I'm a fitness manager. Gotcha. What'd you have for breakfast, Neil? Uh, this morning I had three eggs over easy with two pieces of, uh, Vermont maple syrup flavored sausage, just, uh, some small links. Uh, I put a little bit of salsa on the eggs and some cut up avocado. Very nice. I may have to have one thing I, <laughs> what was that, Dusty? I said I may have to get up and come eat breakfast for you tomorrow. Sounds like a good breakfast. Mm. Yeah, I always try to have my, my protein in the morning. So, you know, usually it's, you know, ha- having eggs is pretty much a main staple. And uh, so when I get time to, you know, to cook good quality breakfast, that's usually what I'm, you know, what I'm frying up. But uh, if, I'm, if I'm in a pinch, the one thing I have a lot of mornings, you know, hunting, which, you know, j- don't tell any of the, the clients, you know, at the gym that I run, but uh, I'll have like a Jimmy <laughs> Dean breakfast bowl uh, sometimes, which, you know, has your, you know, I typically go with the meat lovers. So your bacon, your sausage, your eggs, your potatoes and stuff, you know, all, all in there. Because you can slap it in the microwave, you know, and three minutes later, you got, you know, a nice, you know, nice kind of hearty, you know, you know, hot, hot breakfast that, you know, all you do is microwave, scarf it down before you hop in the truck and head out in the woods. You're right on. Very cool. You get yep. your own billboard, a blank canvas. What would it say? That one's a tough one. I put some you know, time into thinking about that. And I'm, I'm really not sure. I don't really know as far as like, you know, what, what I'd put out there, you know, for a billboard. And, you know, I'd really... I can't really answer that one. I've tried to come up with a good answer for you on that one, Dusty, knowing that you'd probably ask it, but I really just, I don't have anything necessarily to put on a, on a, on a billboard. Not nothing, huh? Nothing at all. How about a hashtag? <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I can't really, you know, think of that. I mean, I don't know if I'd really want to dis- display necessarily anything, you know, and put out there. I guess I don't need to necessarily, you know, broadcast or, you know, or really say any message, you know, at, at this point in time. So, I mean, as far as the billboard, no, I mean, I, I, I guess I can't think of anything. Sorry to let you down on that one. Oh, man, that could be a first, Jay. I think that's a first. <laughs> I, I'm going to make one for you. It just says, be humble. I think that we'll leave it at that. Well, and that's one that I've, I've tried to work on, you know, my life is, uh, you know, especially, you know, it's one of those that, you know, growing up, like I've always been, you know, you know, confident, you know, playing sports growing up. And so I've tried to you know, learn to be more humble and, you know, really seeing that, you know, people that I admire, you know, in my life that, that, that are humble and, you know, it's one of those that I think it also leads to a lot more things in life. And you can be humble and, you know, you don't necessarily have to talk about, you know, your accomplishments as much. You can, you know, let others recognize it for you. Fair enough. Since yep. I say the work successful, who's the first person that pops in your mind and why? Uh, for me, I don't know. It's, 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 it's a hard, that's again, it's a hard, hard one to answer. But I mean, for me, when I think of, you know, successful, um, I, it's, it's kind of a weird way to, to word it in, but you know, I mean, I, my mom, you know, comes to mind is because my mom, she's had, you know, the aspiration in life that she wanted to, you know, raise, you know, her two kids um, and, you know, provide everything she could, you know, to give them a good life and to have them be happy. And so my mom, I think she's done, you know, just that is that, you know, I, I love my mom a lot and she's done a lot for me. And so it's one of those that, you know, if, if her goal in life was to, you know, to, to raise, you know, her son that could be happy and enjoyed life. She's done just that. So, um, so even though it's not like, you know, as far as with my mother, it's not like, you know, she's had a lot of, I guess, you know, personal success. Her success was putting it into her kid. And so, um, that's what she wanted out of life and she's done just that. And so she raised, you know, a happy boy who's, who's gone up to do things that he loved. So I would say my mother. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. What's the day in your life look like, Neil? Uh, well, it depends. Are we talking work days? Or are we talking hunting days? We're talking just the everyday life. Uh, well, so everyday life, uh, would probably start depending on, um, uh, what my schedule at work is going to be like, uh, I'll wake up, I'll have, you know, my typical variation of eggs in the morning for breakfast. Uh, and then from there I'll sit down, have my cup of coffee, maybe get caught up on sports center or now I've started to over the last, you know, year, year and a half, uh, listen to a podcast is pretty much how I start my day, hop in the truck, continue that podcast as I'm driving into work. Um, you know, I mean, this morning I was catching up on, you know, last week's episode of the Big Buck Registry, and I still have to, you know, get through part of that, my ride into work today. And then uh, once I get to work, uh, I'm pretty much, you know, talking health and fitness and, you know, motivating the, the clients at the gym to, you know, really, you know, figure out where they're at, you know, and I also do personal training. So I'll be taking clients, you know, through workouts, sitting down, talking nutrition, just having, you know, motivational talks. And, uh, you know, then from there, get a chance to head home, uh, come back, uh, you know, spend time in the evenings um, with, you know, my girlfriend, my dog, and um, then get a chance to, you know, go to bed and do it all over again. What time do you usually get up, Neil? 
Uh, that varies. If I'm having to go in early, because our sessions start at work at 6 o'clock, so, I mean, I'll be up at 4.30 or 5. If I don't have to go in until later, um, you know, I'm usually up anywhere between 6 and 8 o'clock. I try to, you know, get as close to 8 hours of sleep as I can every night. So I do, for nine months out of the year, I do really well, I think, with, you know, getting my 8 hours of sleep. Um, but then when it comes deer season, uh, that's when I probably average, probably I'd say closer to five, uh, you know, hours a night. Um, so I'd burn the candle on both ends and make sure, you know, if I'm not working, I'm out in the woods hunting. And so that's where it's a lot of, uh, a, a lot of nights with, without much sleep. Gotcha. All right. yeah, makes sense yep. though. What's a hunting day in Neil's life look like? Uh, so a hunting day in the life of Neil would vary whether I'm hunting in New Hampshire or in Maine, but typically, uh, it's going to consist of waking up really early. Uh, I've been one that I always try to get out in the woods as soon as possible, whether it's, you know, half an hour to, I mean, heck, I've been out in the woods as early as, you know, two to three hours before it gets laid out, um, depending on where I'm hunting. So I get up, eat breakfast, get showered. I go through my regimen of showering right before, you know, I, I take off and leave after I've eaten breakfast, drink my coffee. Um, so I want to make sure I'm trying to, you know, eliminate as much scent as possible. Uh, hop in the shower, you know, use the, the scent, scent free sprays. Then from there, um, I mean, the scent free soaps after I've taken, you know, my shower, then, uh, then I'll head down to like a little hunting room that I have, which I have a closet, um, that I use, um, a device that produces ozone, um, similar to, I'm looking forward to, you know, getting the, the scent lock enforcer. I've talked with, you know, Tim Guthrie about that as well. Um, cause I use a similar product now in, in a closet, like a garment closet, you know, that you can hang clothes in. Yep. And so I'll take my, uh, my hunting clothes out of that, that I hung, you know, in there for the evening. Uh, so I've been tried to eliminate all the scent off those. I have a tote box, but I'll then take my clothes out, put them, you know, in the tote box, uh, grab my bow, grab my tote box. Uh, you know, if I can grab me a tree stand, um, pair of boots, head out to the truck, throw them on the back bed of the truck typically. And then from there, hop in and, and drive to where I'm hunting and then get changed. Typical ride over in shorts and a t-shirt. Um, and a pair of flip flops to where I go hunting, and then I'll change into all my hunting clothes right there at the spot, um, and get ready to head on into the woods. Very nice. All right, sounds like you've got a a regimen that you follow. It's nice. Yeah. Yep. So I try to I try to eliminate as much scent as possible, and uh, that's where you know using you know ozone. I think for me, you know, made a big big success last year seeing more deer. Um, you know, just treating my clothes, you know, overnight, turning them inside and out, you know, trying to make sure that, you know, those O3 molecules are binding with any human scent. And yep. you know, I just wanted to try to step my game up. And I was washing my clothes, you know, I'd only try to wear them once before I rewashed them. Um, you know, our, our washing machine, you know, in our house, uh, luckily I have, you know, my girlfriend and I have a roommate who are great that, um, not only during the hunting, hunting season, but before the season now we run, um, you know, unscented laundry detergent through that almost year round now. Um, so that nice. way, not, not only during the season will I use, you know, like the, you know, the scent eliminating soaps, right. but almost year round, we try to use the dye and perfume free, um, you know, laundry detergents. So Excellent. I think I, that helps. Yeah. I think that helps. Yeah. Good. Yep. Very well, good. Neil, that wraps up the 10 rapid fire questions with some great answers you give to us there. And it's always a special part of the show that uh, Jay and myself really and thoroughly enjoy. And we hope you enjoyed answering them. And we hope the listeners enjoy hearing your answers. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I did enjoy answering them. I hope the, the listeners enjoyed them. And uh, sorry I couldn't answer a couple of them there for you. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I tried to think long and hard about the billboard one, but just couldn't come up with something. So I hope I answered the rest of them, you know, as well as I could. Absolutely. Very, Very nice. good. Be great. Yep. Uh, Neil, this has been an honor and a pleasure, and I thoroughly enjoyed listening to your deer story. Uh, and the was it 1,490 days or something crazy like that yep. that, that this took. Um, did you did you actually, and, and I don't know if you name bucks, and I'm not really into it necessarily, but what did you end up, like, putting a name on this deer after you, you finally got it done? So yes, yes and no on that one where over the years, um, it was one of those that I just pretty much called him, you know, plan a or big boy, you know, it was one of those that mm -hmm. we had, you know, di different names just in related to, you know, being a big buck. And so, you know, number one on the hit list. And then, uh, there was a name that, that did, you know, kind of stick. It was actually after, um, it was another odd story, you know, over the years, there's just another one of those ironic ones that got left out. Um, but that hunter that, that I had met that one day who had the shed from a previous season, um, when I stopped at his house that day to, to go ahead and end up, you know, you know, seeing the shed, he had taken down my email and he said, there's one other, you know, person in particular that 
seem to be, you know, pursuing this buck to the same level that I was. And so it was actually something you had on the show back, you know, I don't know if it was, how many episodes ago, but uh, Johnny Parker Brown. Right. Yeah, uh, Johnny um, Brown. Sure. Uh, yep. Johnny Brown. So uh, he ended up emailing me in uh, August of 2014, I believe it was, and uh, said, you know, something to the extent of, uh, here we may be after the same, after the same buck. And, uh, at that point in time, we exchanged emails and, uh, come to find out that he had had a name that he had, you know, kind of adopted to, to the deer because somebody had asked him, you know, once about, you know, this buck that he was after. And so he wanted to come up with a name that was kind of adequate to the stature of it, but didn't really allude to what it was. And so of course, you know, every hunter's dream is a Boone and Crockett buck, right? Right. So he came up with a name, Daniel for the buck, you know, for Daniel Boone. For there Boone Crockett Buck, Daniel yeah. Boone. So this name Daniel, which you know, which Johnny had come up with, when we had had conversations about knowing that we were, you know, both hunting him, that's a name that you know that that you know we'd both you know to be able to reference him would call, and so it was kind of something you know between us and between other you know you know kind of close hunting friends sure. would use that name you know Daniel, but. Uh, for the most part, I had never really, you know, had a name attached. So I've had a hard time, you know, trying to, you know, trying to name some of the some of the deer that I've gone after. Where now, my girlfriend, she loves coming up with names, so she's the one, you know, assigned to to naming all the deer. You know, they get pictures of the the good bucks that, you know, maybe a wall hanger according to her. So gotcha. So cool. Yeah, whether right. Plan A, Big Boy, or Daniel, yeah. All right, so well, Daniel the Buck, very nice. Uh, yep. And Neil, this has been great, and thank you so much for joining us on the show. It's it was an absolute pleasure, and uh, hopefully. Uh, you'll have a, a, another story to tell in the near future and you're always welcome back. Yeah. No, I, I really hope, uh, you know, it's one of those that I, I feel like I've had, you know, fortunate hunting career. And after, you know, pr- pursuing this buck, you know, for as long as I did, it's going to be hard to, it's going to be hard to, to talk this one. I mean, we are talking, you know, buck that, you know, not only was 10 and a half years old, Jay, but you know, I, uh, the total gross score was, you know, 192 inches. He had 22 points you know, dressed at 237 pounds. It's, you know, it's going to be tough, tough to beat that one, but I just, you know, love the, you know, the, the adventure of going after them and trying to target, you know, and patting those big bucks. So, um, again, it's been an honor, you know, to be on the show. And, uh, and this is truly, you know, the, the, the deer of my lifetime. It's, you know, it's been an honor talking to you guys about it and sharing the stories and hopefully, you know, all the, all the listeners out there, you know, loved hearing the story as well. And hopefully they get a chance, you know, to, to really hunt and pursue, you know, that buck of their lifetime, because it's, it's, you know, something that I hope every hunter gets a chance to experience, you know, to have that excitement going into the deer woods every day, every season, you know, just knowing that he still could be out there. And it's just, you know, it's just an experience that I hope everyone really gets to partake in. Uh, that was great. I just, it's always nice to hear how somebody from New Hampshire is routinely killing big deer. And, and Neil, yeah, he, I don't think he's pretty humble. So he's not, I don't think he really thinks about how good a hunter he is but as we have built this contingent this facebook following this this tribe of diehard deer hunting fans we pay attention to those who send in the most big bucks and when we see that that's when we strike that's when we want to know what the heck are they doing right you know being, being as consistent as neil has in new hampshire that uh that speaks volumes i've been there i've done that and it's no easy task to to let alone shoot a deer, see a deer, or even hear a deer run off in New Hampshire is pretty unlikely. Right. Yeah, even if you jump them, it's pretty pretty unlikely. Uh, but Neil seems to have no problem interacting with deer. He's like Mr. Deer of New Hampshire. So He could be the New Hampshire deer whisperer. I, I, that's, I think we shall call him that from now on. Uh, thanks to Neil for joining us on the Big Buck Podcast and telling us about how he does it and sharing it with you so you can do it too. Well, Dusty, do we have a Chubby Tines tip of the week this week? You know, we do, Jay. It- the Chubby Tines tip of the week is sponsored by Morse's Sporting Goods. Firearms, use firearms, bows, use bows. Located at 85 Kentucky Falls Road in Hillsborough, New Hampshire. Give Jim a call at 603-464-3444, morse'ssportinggoods.com. Your dollars go further in New Hampshire. There's no sales tax. Morse's Sporting Goods. Uh, it, it comes down to... Uh- your landowners, you know, they're they're taking care of you and by allowing you to hunt their land, uh, you know, take care of them. The holidays are upon us, and if you you can't do it, uh, you know, Thanksgiving's passed here by Saturday of the show. But uh, think about Christmas. Just a, a simple little fruit basket goes a long way with your landowners. There you go. That's a great, great idea. Very, very nice. 
it's that time of year to give back to some of the landowners that generously let you hunt on them. And uh, it's it's kind of hard for us to do that in New Hampshire because there's so much vast land and the, the land use rights are a little different, but there are still posted pieces of property that we get permission to hunt on. And that's when you want them to go say thank you. So how I there's nothing that you could do as a hunter, I don't think, if you hunt on private land and you need to, that helps that relationship continue. Yeah, for sure. Thanks to Sunlock Enforcer for sponsoring the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast. Thanks to the Eurohanger for also sponsoring the show. And thank you to Morse Sporting Goods for sponsoring the Chubby Tines Tip of the Week. Dusty, where can we find you when you're not hanging out in Big Buck Studios? No, oh, right now you can find me in Ohio ground blind here in, in, in the big woods of Ohio looking for a giant buck. But uh, if you don't know where that's at, you can shoot me an email, dusty at bigbuckregistry.com. Look me on Facebook, Chubby Tines Outdoors, or send me a follow request at Chasing Antler on Instagram. Jay, where can the people reach out to you when you're not on the mic? Uh, best police. Uh, well, I'll be deep in the New Hampshire deer woods looking for a track as the snow flies, but uh, would like to kind of pin me down and ask me a question or make a suggestion or whatever. Uh, send me an email, j at bigbuckregistry.com. You can follow us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. You can check us out on Twitter and Instagram, same thing, twitter.com forward slash bigbuckregistry, instagram.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. We're on YouTube, which is youtube.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. You can listen to the show, not just on iTunes, but you can listen to it on Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Google Plus, Blueberry, and every single show we do is produced as a video on YouTube where you can listen to the, the audio Uh, as a video over there as well. And uh, last but not least, if you have a couple dollars and you can spare it and you enjoy the content that we bring you on the show, we could always use more support. We could use your support to keep the show going. We have expenses. Yes, we have some sponsors, but there are other expenses that we need to pay for. We do want to bring you more rich content. That means we have to get out of the studios and go shake some hands, meet some people, and set up these interviews so we can bring them to you. And in order to do that, there's money involved. There's travel costs. We don't have a huge budget, but we definitely need that money to offset our costs so we can keep doing this. And if you'd like to become a patron, all you have to do is go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash pledge. And I'll bring you to our Patreon page and all the details will be right there for you. If you'd like to share your big buck, go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash my buck and we'll, all the instructions will be right there on how to get your buck featured on our Facebook page. Well, Dusty, I think that's everywhere we are at. That's a whole lot of big bug, Jay. Well, uh, I think it's time to sign off. Unfortunately, we have to go, but the good news is we'll be back next week. I'm Jay Scott. I'm Dusty Phillips. And this is the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast. We'll see you next week. Can't wait.